is now in session for the regularly scheduled meeting of February 6, 2020. My name is Emily Lamb, and I will be presenting the cases to the board for their review in today's public hearing. Members of the public at this time, please take a minute to turn off or otherwise silence your cell phones and devices so the board may consider the cases without interruption. My back is going to remain turned to you so that I can speak into the mic. Please don't mistake me for being rude. And also, when we get to the consent agenda, make sure I know that you're here if you have opposition. For these public hearings, the board reviews the correspondence submitted in support of and opposition to these cases. The board also reviews correspondence and recommendations from other government agencies in preparation for the hearings. In today's hearing, staff will present the site plans, maps, photographs, and other documents that comprise the case record. At the conclusion of the staff presentation, the appellant will present his or her case to the board. <coughs> After the appellant's presentation, the board will hear those wishing to speak in support of the appeal. If the appeal has opposition, the board will then hear from those parties. After the opposition presents its testimony, the appellant will have a period for rebuttal. According to the BZA rules, the <coughs> appellant has five minutes for presentation if no opposition is present. In contested cases, the BZA rules allow 10 minutes for each side to present testimony. Should the appellant wish to provide rebuttal testimony, the appellant should reserve some portion of the allotted 10 minutes. At the conclusion of each hearing, the board will deliberate and then vote on that case. The board is vested with the power to act on these cases under the provisions of the Metro Zoning Code, Section 1740-180. All section numbers that we refer to come from the Metro Zoning Code, which implies to the entire jurisdiction of the Metropolitan Government. The Zoning Code was adopted by the Metro Council and became effective on January 1, 1998. I will introduce the entire Zoning Code and make it a part of today's record. The Metro Code requires a record of these proceedings. Because M uh, BZA meetings are recorded for the Metro Nashville Network, it is imperative that anyone addressing the board come forward to this podium and speak into the microphones. Or actually, you all would sit at that table and speak into those microphones. All speakers should identify themselves by name and address and then make the desired presentation. The Metro Code uh, requires four members of our seven-member board to establish quorum. The Code also requires at least four affirmative votes to grant an appeal. In the event that five or more members are present, but the appeal fails to receive four affirmative votes, the case will remain on the board's agenda for the next 30 days. Applications that fail to receive four affirmative votes within 30 days of the public hearing will be deemed denied by operation of law. Pursuant to board rules, an aggrieved party may appeal board decisions to Chancery or Circuit Court within 60 days of the entry of a BZA order. Additionally, as per the BZA rules, an aggrieved party may file a motion for rehearing with, by the BZA within 60 days of the original hearing date. After that time elapses, the board's decision becomes final and no further action can be taken. If your appeal is granted, you are required to obtain the permit for which you applied. A permit must be obtained within two years for a board approval to remain valid. It should also be noted that if false or misleading testimony is presented to the board, any board approval could be revoked at a later date by means of a show cause hearing before the BZA. Mr. Chairman, I submit that all cases have been filed in proper order, all appellants have been notified by certified mail, and all legal notice requirements have been fulfilled. Just in time. I do have some preliminary announcements regarding deferrals. First case 2020-038 has been deferred to March 5th. And case 2020-039 has been deferred to February 20th. For members, now that's too loud. Can't, figure, can't find the happy medium. For members of the public, our board utilizes a consent agenda at each of its meetings. One board member reviews the record for each case prior to the hearing and identifies those cases which meet the criteria for the requested action by the appellant. If the reviewing board member determines that testimony in the case would not alter the material facts in any substantial way, the case is then recommended to the board for approval. We will enter into the record those cases that have been so recommended, and if anyone is here in opposition to one of the cases identified for the consent agenda, please raise your hand, make sure you speak up or somebody up there sees you because my back is to you. If we know you're here in opposition to the case, we will pull it from the consent agenda and hear it in its regular order. Mr. Chairman, these are the cases that have been recommended for the consent agenda. First case, 2020-028, involving property at 2618 Buchanan Street. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 28? Next case, 2020-032, involving property at 4810 Briarwood Drive. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 32? 
Case 2020-036, involving property at 806 Hart Lane. Is there anyone here in opposition to Case 36? Case 2020-042, involving property at 415 Creedmoor Drive. Is there anyone here in opposition to Case 42? And finally, Case 2020-043, involving property at 905 Wilson Boulevard. Is there anyone here in opposition to Case 43? Seeing none to review, Mr. Chairman, the cases on the consent agenda are case 2020-028, 32, 36, 42, and 43. We would solicit a vote from the board at this time. Hey, there's a motion for the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. There's a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor of the consent agenda say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion passes. Members of the public, if your case was just approved on the consent agenda, you're welcome to stay, but you are free to go. Please give our staff until Monday to process all the documentation associated with your appeal, at which point you can come in to pursue the permits for which you've applied. At this point, we typically take an opportunity to let council members or other elected officials speak. I don't see anyone in attendance unless they have come in while my back was turned. So um, absent any other announcements, Mr. Chairman, we're ready to proceed with the cases to be heard. All right, first case. First case for the board to consider is case 2019-478, involving property at 650 Putnam Drive. This is a request for a variance from front street setback requirements. Is Robert Cockrum the appellant here on this case? Yes. So we're ready to proceed with this case. Before you is a zoning map showing the zoning of the property as RS-15. This is the aerial photography giving you a sense of the property and surrounding area. This is the site plan submitted by the applicant. And finally, the photograph showing you the current conditions of the property. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 478? No. Seeing none, you'll have five minutes to make your presentation. Please be sure to identify yourself by name and address. You can sit at one of those chairs. No, no, I don't think your mic's on. Hang, hang one sec. Hello. There you go. Uh, Robbie Cockrum, uh, 650 Putnam Drive. So requesting a street setback variance. Uh, here today, just to kind of clarify where, what I need to do moving forward, um, there's been some discussion previously that I need to get a survey done on the property to give some context to what the situation involves. As you can see, actually, my house is the one on the bottom right there. Uh, being a newer homeowner, uh, I actually began to build the porch, um, and then an inspector came by and said, you should probably check on that to see that you might need a permit. So it is about half finished um, as it is down there on the right and has continued to be that way. So um, unaware of that at the time, um, that is the current situation. As far as the street setback that we're dealing with, uh, the survey is, uh, those tend to be pricey. So I'm looking right now for an alternative to see if we you can You know how far, how far, do you have any idea what the setback is? What's it supposed to be? The part of, yeah. you know, part of the reason that when, you know, when I was looking at this and it, it made it difficult for me to even consider it for a, a consent agenda or anything like that is I just didn't know exactly what you were asking for. I know you're only adding eight feet of a porch to the front. Max, yeah. And which doesn't seem like a lot, but I don't know, you know, most of the time we'll have information that says the setback is 45 feet and you want it to be 40. Do you have any idea how much you're encroaching yeah, into Yeah, and so that's, I want to see what, what I need officially. If we can get around the survey, great. And so there's options for getting a licensed contractor to take the measurements and getting some document to show that, documentation for that. That's an option. Um, as far as how far the porch ex currently extends past my neighbor's porch, it's only maybe four to six feet. Um, so as far as a, anything lining up, that's what we're dealing with. I realize the street setback is slightly different from that. Um, so I'm looking for t an alternative to the survey, if, if that's an option. Um, the neighbors have already approved this. I can get that in writing. The councilman is in support of that. I can get that in writing. I actually expected him to be here today, but I don't see him here. Um, so that's kind of what I have to offer. If we can 
do something besides the survey. And then do you through. expect the porch to, the, your, the porch will be covered, but it won't be enclosed? Right. So there'll just be a gable over the top of it. Is it uh, like a screened porch or is it just a covered porch? Just a cover. Okay. So we're requesting a, f a few feet and I can get an official measurement if that will help. It's just the survey. If we can get around that, that would be terrific. Okay. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? No, that's it. Okay. Um, then I'll close the public hearing so that we can discuss um, if that's if the photos that you provided and the information you provided are sufficient or if we'd like to have additional information. The, 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 the part of the case to me that was a little challenging is that I don't have that kind of basic information to know how much um, of a variance we're really asking for and yet at the same time there are some fairly thorough photographs from the street and of the other houses to get a context and you know that the request itself in terms of a, a, an eight foot deep porch on the front of a house uh, of this type are typically viewed with an, a, a pretty open mind here um, especially if they're not enclosed so I guess the question I have to my fellow board members are do you need additional information I'd like <clears throat> what what is the most that it extends into this what what is the most variants we're asking for in terms of footage I, that's what I can't tell what the setback the required setback is it, it looks like it looks like according to his drawing that that the bulk of this deck is eight feet and then there's a little uh, push out area for steps that maybe adds another three or four <laughs> Uh, How far are we extending into the setback? Well, that's what we don't know. Okay. And, and I think that was it. Is, I think what he had testified to was that, you know, to, to go have it actually, and, and I think it's a contextual setback, so it's, is that right? It, I mean, it, it, it's more complicated, I think, than just saying, how far are you from the street? Because I... That's right. So with the contextual setback, it's the average of the four, two on each side adjacent properties, and we typically... Or provided with or require a contextual, or I'm sorry, a setback survey. It doesn't have to be a full survey, but we do typically require a setback survey so that we know what the neighboring property's setbacks are so that we can determine what the contextual setback is for this particular property. And that's why we don't, he, the applicant has not provided that survey, so we're, we don't have a way to confirm what this contextual setback actually is. And it's the two houses on either side? That's right. But if you look at, I guess, on page 15 of our packet, you know, it, it, it's not a survey by any stretch, but it is the property map that plots the houses, and they seem like they're all in the same line to me. So it seemed, um, so again, the question is, what more do, what more do you want? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a little uncomfortable not knowing how far it's extending into the setback area. The other thing is, what is the hardship here? Typically on the, um, you know, again, uh, the hardship in the past has almost been an architectural one. It's, you know, you have, it's, it's houses like this that are little ranch houses that, you know, were built with, you know, when the style was to put them right at the setback and with, you know, out any coverage in the front porch and, and, and the thought that, you know, a small front porch that's not enclosed isn't, um, you know, it wouldn't cause damage to a neighbor or, or, sure. or cause any, anything like that. And, um, and at this point in its life, you can't really move the house backwards, you know, uh, it kind of, it is what it is. And a porch isn't an unreasonable, you know, it, for some people it's a safety issue because it keeps rain off of them when they're leaving their home and that type of thing. Um, Well, I want to note that we have no opposition, and and he did say he expected his council member to, to show up today. I wouldn't blame anybody for not coming out today. The weather's not exactly beautiful out there. But um, I would certainly not want him to have to pay a fortune to get a full-fledged survey, and our council doesn't indicate that they need a full-fledged survey. But perhaps we could continue this one meeting and have him get at least some measurements. So 
we would know what we're talking about. So, so a measurement from the street to each home, on the two homes on from the street to each home. Uh, on either, two two down from him, so he would have a total of five homes, two on each side plus his. How far they are from the street, and then how. Um, what the true measurements are of his deck, because I think he, he has a drawing and it has eight by 15, but that doesn't include the steps, so the full drawing of the deck. Um, and since there, he doesn't have a garage to pull into, that porch is very helpful to make the house more livable, and of course, getting packages or whatever else, everybody there any other needs a porch. information that would be helpful to make a decision? Does that make sense? If you can at least get that information to us, uh, and, and, and I think that if your neighbor's support and your council member supports, if they have can uh, support that in writing, that would be helpful too. And, and I can't say that given all that, how the board would vote or how they feel because we didn't discuss that specifically. Um, but I think at a minimum we would need that and that might suffice instead of the survey. Sure, makes absolute sense. I just want to clarify exactly what I needed okay. and let's move forward. Is that, did anybody else have anything? So with that, I'll move that we defer this case one meeting to the 20th of February. Second. Second. Motion, second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? All right, we'll see you again next meeting. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, next case. Next case for the board to consider is case 2020-004 involving property at 4321 Old Hickory Boulevard. This is an item A appeal challenging the issuance of a building permit for a telecommunication tower at this property. Before you was a zoning map showing the zoning of the property as R15. This is the area of photography giving you a sense of the surrounding area. Photograph showing you the current conditions of the property as well as up and down the street. There is opposition to this case, so each side will have 10 minutes to make their presentation. The appellant can go ahead and come forward, sit at the table. Um, remember, this is a cumulative combined 10 minutes, so if you're the spokesperson, you've got 10 minutes. If there are other people, give them some time as well. Um, and then, that's right. So there's 10 minutes for the, for the appellant to make a presentation and then 10 minutes for the opposition. If you have any rebuttal you would like to make to the opposition, make sure you reserve that from your 10 minutes. Um, and then be sure to identify yourself by name and address. Okay. And before we get started, I want to just say, uh, uh, just so the, the uh, folks in the audience know uh, exactly uh, how we approach a case like this. This is an item A uh, appeal, which uh, is challenging the issuance of a building permit. And what that means is that the people who are bringing this appeal are saying, in effect, that the zoning administrator and or uh, his office erred in issuing the building permit. Uh, we're not here to talk about the merits of a cell tower um, or the impact of a cell tower or anything like that outside of how it may relate to a criteria to permit a cell tower. Right. And so, um, and, and I'm not saying that that's how you, you know, there are some things in, in your presentation, you know, and a lot of people that say I don't want a cell tower, but you have to get specific uh, in, in, this, in, in your arguments to say why the zoning administrator erred. And the way that we usually do these cases, uh, any type of item A case is that we hear first from the zoning administrator to um, just have a, a brief uh, it's information on why the permit was issued. Uh, then we're going to hear from the folks who brought the appeal uh, who are opposed to the permit. Uh, then we hear from the people who are the permit holders, and they can tell us why they believe the permit was uh, issued uh, correctly. And at any time, if there's uh, a council person here, that person is uh, free to speak at, at whatever time he or she chooses. So just want to make sure everybody understands uh, the process and the question that this board is uh, tasked with asking today, and that is, did the zoning administrator <laughs> err in issuing a permit? So we'll hear from the zoning administrator. Mr. Chairman, this cell tower permit application was reviewed by our zoning staff to confirm compliance with the applicable legal requirements. Cell tower siting is governed primarily by federal law, and although those federal guidelines govern the majority of the field for cell tower regulations, there are a few specific local provisions um, or specific provisions of the Metro Zoning Code that apply as well. Specifically, Metro Code of Law Section 17.16.080C addresses telecommunication facilities and the requirements for permitting such facilities. 
As part of the application for this particular tower project, representatives for the project submitted extensive documentation specifically addressing the manner in which they complied with each of these legal provisions under the Metro Code. That documentation included not only the thorough statement of compliance, which outlined the legal provisions, and the engineered site plans, but also the engineer's letter regarding engineered breakpoint analysis, all of which is contemplated under the Metro Code. Based upon review and approval of that documentation and subsequent approval from other reviewing Metro agencies, including uh, ITS and Metro Planning, the permit was issued on or about November the 6th of 2019. To his credit, the district council member has been in contact with Metro Codes about this project virtually from its inception. Our discussions with council member Hager continued even after permit issuance. The board will recall that this project actually involved a BZA case that involved a sidewalk variance request um, that was decided in August of 2019 and that had included valuable input, input from council member Hager at that time as well. Ultimately, this item A appeal is just a challenge to the legality or accuracy of the issuance of the subject permit. Zoning staff within the codes department maintains that the permit was issued legally based upon the legal criteria before them. The specifics of those individual points of legal compliance are outlined in the extensive documentation provided by the representatives for the cell tower project. Those representatives will be more than capably uh, represented today and they'll cap be capable of addressing the board on the particulars of the project's legal compliance and the propriety of the permit's issuance. Okay, thank you. Any questions for the zoning administrator? All right, we will hear from the appellant. If you would state your name and address and tell us uh, your case. I am Laura Harris-Smith. Um, I, I live at 300 Aaronwood Court in Hampton Park, 50 yards away from proposed cell tower at 4321 Old Hickory Boulevard. I'm a 55-year native of Nashville, a 30-year resident of Old Hickory in the same house, and the proud representative of the Old Hickory No Tower Commission. Um, for the sake of time, I'm not going to be able to go over all 12 arguments in the legal brief, which you've had now for months, um, which I genuinely hope you've had time to read and watch the videos therein. In early July of 2019, citizens of Old Hickory, Tennessee, began hearing rumors of a proposed cell tower literally in their backyards, a project that was months in the works but without proper notice. A few researched and discovered that under Metro Substitute Ordinance number BL 2016-415-4EV, their local council member was supposed to be notified by the zoning administrator prior to the issuance of a zoning permit was pre-approved, and immediately after receiving an application for a new tower. That did not happen. Immediately after receiving the application, the law says it is, quote, required when a tower is proposed within a residential district, which it is, a district permitting residential uses, which it does, or within 1,000 feet of a zoning boundary line of a residential district or a district permitting residential uses, which it is. Such notification shall also be required when a tele telecommunications facility is within a historic overlay district or right of way abutting a historic overlay district. It does abut Andrew Jackson's The Hermitage Section 106 letter I'll address in just a moment. The ordinance goes on to say within 30 days from the date on which the tower application was filed, the direct council member may hold a community meeting on the proposed tower, which Councilman Hagar did, but residents were only alerted about a sidewalk dispute. Evidently, Councilman Hagar did call a community meeting as much as four months after the application was filed, but the meeting did not meet ordinance requirements. Residents learned that ordinance number BL 2016-415-4EV states if a meeting is held, the applicant shall attend and provide information about the tower's safety, technical necessity, visual aspects, and alternative tower sites and designs considered. And while SCI Tower's attorney, Joel Hargis, did attend this August 6th meeting at Berryville Baptist Church on his birthday, he did not answer questions uh, that were heated and addressed directly to these issues. Since not all residents within 1,000 feet of the zoning boundary line were notified when the meeting town, town meeting was called, um, it was too late to have a strong show. Nonetheless, um, I quickly designed and distributed 30 flyers on foot in 100 de degree weather. Um, Linda Guffey, sitting here behind me, 70 years old, sorry, Linda, she got out in 100 degree weather and distributed these things that had not been done. Um, and she fell, bruised ribs, cut, had to spend days recovering. But as a result of this, uh, 50 residents did show up to that meeting. An online uh, petition had been started that same day, 
And by the end of the meeting, there were also 40 signatures on it. So by the end of the first day of anyone even discovering this, almost 100 people were in opposition to it. The Old Hickory No Tower Commission was born and now it numbers more than 900, and that is your uh, Exhibit B. A thousand homes represented by this, we have 935 signatures. So, uh, due to Metro Ordinance's required information not being provided at SCI Towers rep by the representative at the meeting, citizens requested another meeting at which a better informed representative could be pre present to answer important questions, again, that are required in compliance with Metro Ordinance BL 2016-415. The second town meeting was held two weeks after the first on August 22nd at Eastgate Creative Christian Fellowship. Present were about 150 <coughs> residents who opposed the tower. And just like the first, no one spoke in favor of wanting the tower. Also present was Councilman Larry Hagar and Metro Code's attorney Emily Lamb. So were members of local television media. Although that meeting had been re requested specifically to receive more answers about the tower, no new ones were given, and even Ms. Lamb admitted she could not answer certain questions with specificity. Specificity, excuse me. To her defense, it did not appear she had been informed that this meeting was called specifically to receive such answers. The summer and fall of 2019 became for hundreds of Old Hickory residents the summer that we learned to write our elected officials, discover our First Amendment right to petition, research how to better protect our health in the face of expanding technology, and connected with neighbors we'd never met. We are an army rallying in 100% agreement about our opposition to this tower. We are argument number one in your legal brief, and now I move into some of those. For instance, argument two, citing inadequate property setbacks that do not account for breakpoint technology failure and could cause loss of human life. On August 13th, uh, in a letter to SCI Towers from tower engineer Michael Plahovensack, which you referenced, uh, in Ohio, raises many questions for the Old Hickory residents who live within steps of this tower. They cite concerns over the wirelessestimator.com statistics that say that every month in America, a cell tower catches fire with almost 100 articles on such fire. The reason for residents' urgent concern is that the proposed tower sits just feet away from Speedway Gas Station, also on the same Levog property. Should a cell tower fire occur, they argue this could be a deadly, explosive event and result in massive loss to human life. Engineer Pla Plahovensack's letter also states, and this is important, he has only designed the tower to withstand a three-second gusted wind of 90 miles per hour. It does mention being built for a wind speed of 116 miles per hour, but this does not list time span of sustainability. Our brief cites news reports from as recent as February 20th, 2019, which record wind gusts in Tennessee of 123 miles per hour. Even closer to home, and therefore more alarming, was 100 miles per hour in our very area. His is built for 90 miles per hour. Also cited is that the 140 to 150 foot tower would sit within 85 feet of the property line for a strip mall containing a children's trampoline park and other local areas of traffic by children, including three area churches with childcare programs, rotary ballpark, thousands of children come by this area monthly. And it would be in walking distance of the tower, which will not be protected by anything other than a chain link fence and signs telling children not to climb it. Argument seven says the permit should be revoked because SCI Towers never provided the requested disclosure of, disclosure of alternate tower locations that had been considered for the tower under the same Metro Ordinance BL 2016. It states, again, that applicants shall attend and provide information about tower safety, technical necessity, visual effects, alternate tower sites, designed and considered. This was requested at both meetings and was not provided. Um, I'm going to skip down here of utmost priority under argument nine is the fact that on October 19th, the No Tower Committee, uh, me uh, in this instance, reached out to Levog owner James Levin in New York by letter. He is the landowner. Introducing myself to him as his neighbor of 30 years since I've lived in my home for 30 years and he's been uh, the landowner for 31 years next door to me. I petitioned Levin to consider the majority neighborhood uprising and organized efforts to oppose this tower, sent a full 13-page report, the 900-signature petition, and Levin responded very compassionately. I submitted the document citing the Metro Rules of Procedure. Um, uh, I submit that here to you now, actually, if you would like it. I submit it based on uh, Metro Rules of Procedure 6D. Any documentation the applicant wishes to provide to the board after the deadline can be presented to the board members by providing nine copies at the public hearing. 
And this is very important. The reason I did not include it in the legal brief was out of courtesy to Mr. Levin. I wanted him to know, just out of integrity, I wanted him to know that his words were being used in public. So here is his letter and what he stated. I did not submit it with the legal brief, as I said, uh, for that reason. But here are his responses. Number one, no one had told him about the No Tower Commission and our months of organized efforts, 10, 10 months, uh, or their efforts uh, on local media, which involved his name. Number two, he reasoned that an environmental impact assessment would surely need to be done before issuing the permit. And number three, he states, and this is, this is important, let me assure you that Levog would be willing to negotiate an equitable exit strategy with them as CI Towers. We submitting in writing the request for a full NEPA environmental impact assessment. And you'll actually see under arguments eight and 10 that it is required by the FCC. They require an NEPA be done if and there are many of the reasons stated in here, such as if it is on um, a sacred Indian site, this is the Trail of Tears, State Route 45 is the Trail of Tears. Um, we've contacted the, Ch the Cherokee Nation. Um, of course, if it's a, a wildlife habitat, we have many, many deer, you can see that under, I believe that's exhibit uh, M. And then of course, the fact that it uh, abuts up next to the hermitage. And that, they did receive a section 106 letter saying they were fine with it, but I would submit to you that because of the act um, of, it's actually the, because it's on the registered um, historic place, there is a act of the Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act of 2012, which would write the owners a blank check on increasing the height. So we see premeditation by the tower uh, representatives here that they will one day seek to eyesore, to, this will seek to be an eyesore towering over the skies of the Hermitage, and at that point the Hermitage will be able to do nothing about it. So again, in closing, landowner James Levin of Levog is willing to negotiate an equitable exit for SCI Towers if we can stop the construction and the permit. And we have indeed stayed construction and also spoken twice with Hermitage Golf Course at 3939 Old Hickory Boulevard, the Eller family. And they are willing to have a discussion with SCI Towers about taking the tower. Having the tower on their property would still increase sales service without decreasing property values of local residents. And we have realtor letters saying that in Nashville they are having a very difficult time selling homes near cell towers with a decrease of property value up to 20%. And ma'am, your, your time is up, so let me ask if there are any questions for the board. Are there any questions at this time? Has that been a full 10 minutes? I literally have two seconds and I petitioned the board based on rule 813 saying either the appellant or opposition may ask for additional time in case. It's been a long 10 months. Right. It's been a long 10 months. If I just asked for two more sentences. If there's no objection to having adding two minutes to each side and that would be her entire rebuttal period. Uh, did anybody object to adding two minutes to each side? All right, I'm gonna add two minutes to your time but that includes your rebuttal period, so. Okay. This is all we're proposing, that SCI Towers look into one of the alternative sites they say exist but have failed to disclose, or the Hermitage Golf Course. This would benefit uh, the golf course tremendously, get SCI Towers, uh, SCI Towers to provide their increased coverage and allow our homeowners to breathe a sigh of relief for keeping their property values intact. That is not just a win-win for the whole community, that's a win-win-win. And on SCI Towers' own website homepage, there is the following motto, consistently flexible in the development of wireless infrastructure, and that's all we're asking today, is for SCI Towers to be flexible. Thank you for your okay. time. All right, you'll have about a minute and 45 seconds for rebuttal, and we will hear now from the permit holder. Yes, probably. No, no, just, just, just go back. Yeah, just leave, leave the row here. Just go back to your seat where you were, and that way you can hear what's said, and then you can come back to the table when it's your turn, uh, when they're done.
All right, if you would state your name and. Good afternoon, members. Uh, Joey Hargis, uh, attorney Baker Dawson. To my right is Lee Chapman with SCI Towers. And uh, we thank you for taking the time to uh, hear our side of the story today. I've submitted to you guys our response to Miss uh, Miss Smith's brief. And I'm going to cover only the things, as, as the uh, chairman talked about, this board is focused on uh, whether or not this permit should have been issued. Of course, it's our contention it was properly done so. Uh, this is not an appeal. And so I'm going to address only the items that Ms. Smith covered that are actually in our ordinance uh, with that. So I do that today, and I begin with uh, Ms. Smith talked about argument two, that uh, as far as the the setback and the issues with that. Our tower conforms with both requirements of setback under the code of law. Uh, there are two that are involved. One is the actual setback, and I'll read from the, the code itself. And it states that a tower shall be set back from all property lines on which the tower is located by distance equal to the height of the lowest engineered break point on the proposed structure or height of the tower. Uh, things that are not in that sentence, whichever is greater, and that's what Ms. Smith is arguing to you should be the case. That is not what the ordinance requires. So it requires either a break point if a tower has one, which ours does, and it's 85 feet. Uh, our tower sits 85 feet from the uh, property to the south and over 124 feet to the residential properties to the west. The and what, what is it, the break point means what? The break point is the point in which the tower is designed uh, in the event of a, a failure uh, that the tower would collapse. The uh, monopole type towers do not fall like trees, so they don't fall in a solid piece. They will bend, uh, think similar to a drinking straw. So there's an engineered point inside that tower at which the, uh, it, in the event the tower fails, it'll, it'll crumple on itself. So there's just a single failure of it. It's not a, it's a bend and that's it, not a bend and a further collapse. Um, Ms. Smith talked about this tower being mere feet from a, uh, gas station, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the board, this, this tower is over 660 feet from a gas station. This gas station is not on the landowner's property. It's on the adjoining property. Secondly, the, uh, the tower also has a requirement for a height restriction. So towers are not only encumbered by the setback and under the so section entitled setback under the zoning code, but there's also a sky plane in which towers have to meet. Uh, based upon the the formula for computing that, there's only an 80-foot setback required. So the 85-foot engineer falls zone is greater. Obviously, it controls in that case. So our tower fully complies with that section. Uh, Ms. Smith talked about, too, I, I'll, I'll skip through the, um, the portions. I've submitted evidence. Uh, Ms. Smith made uh, assertions and opinions by realtors that this would devalue the property. I submitted into the record a study from Metro's own data from the assessor's office showing that three locations in Davidson County where towers sit much closer to property lines and houses than this one. And in each of the case, there was an increase in value over time from the time the tower was constructed until today. Now, I'm not making an assertion that towers raise property values or that, these, that this increase is because of the tower, but the uh, Opposition has asserted in their letter that there's a 20% decrease in value of property, and that's really not the case. Uh, item six, we talked about, uh, Ms. Smith discussed uh, the meeting which was held on August 8th, which was my birthday, um, and this neighborhood meeting, there was about 50 or 60 folks there, very angry folks, I might add. Uh, I did bring with me copies of the site plan, the um, RF maps that that Verizon provided to us to explain why we needed this site. I've also submitted that presentation into this record of why Verizon's locating here uh, and what, it, what its purposes are. I have it here, I'm happy to display it, but you all should have it in your record. But uh, Lee is here with me to talk about a little bit about why they chose this site and why not some other location, because I think it's important to address that. Hi again, my name's Lee Chapman, thank you for your time. Um, we're a tower builder and we're facilitating the tower to accommodate a need by Verizon Wireless. Uh, Verizon, as as needs arise for coverage, which again you have in your, your package, you can see what, what the objective is. Um, these areas that need coverage 
are becoming smaller and smaller in the ability to just say, okay, why not just go a mile down the road? Well, there are no existing towers in this immediate vicinity. Um, we don't have... <coughs> There are, there are towers within a mile of this vicinity. And as your data shows, Verizon is on those towers so that what's trying to fill, there are no substitute towers for our location. So, so in the beginning, we had this uh, uh, directive from Verizon this is that we needed a site in the air this, in, this, in this vicinity. Um, we, our, first, our first thing is to uh, look at the zoning code and see where the zoning code directs us with that knowledge of saying, okay, this is what the zoning code is saying that they would like for us to see, we went out to this area and the very first thing we see is Hermitage. So we've been working with the Hermitage from day one. We approached them to say, we recognize the sensitivity. Uh, you know, is there some place on your property? We looked at the ball field that they that they, under, they control the ground under, and we looked at other properties in the area and the Hermitage. Uh, gave us guidance for what they would like to see, and in fact, this area, this location, was we have we have federal guidelines that we do adhere to, which I'm sure Mr. Hargis will get to. But uh, we worked with them for in a suitable place at a suitable height that they would uh, agree that, that this tower would fit. Uh, with that, the zoning allowance, and we contacted uh, several property owners that uh, have that zoning guidance to say we want to be here. Uh, and this is uh, uh, this landowner said they wanted to be uh, that they would accommodate us, and and that in a nutshell is how we ended up on this property because we met the code. I, I get the the I guess the will you address Joey the the notification uh, issues that the uh, other side had talked about in terms of uh, appropriate and. A, sure and Nothing adequate happened. notification because uh, it does sound like there were at least several meetings it sounds like people obviously knew about the meeting and, you know whether everybody did but yeah. i don't know because but if, if you have 150 folks at a meeting that uh suggests that the word had gotten out but could you uh, tell us your perspective on what are the the notification requirements and then what you actually did to meet those requirements well let me first uh take the last part of your question, uh, that the notification requirement is not on the applicant to provide that notification. That notification comes from the codes department to the, to the district council member, and then the member, if they choose to hold a neighborhood meeting, sends a notice out to the neighbors. That, that notice, some jurisdictions do require the applicants to do it, but Metro is not one of those. Uh, so in this case, I'll submit to you, we made our formal building permit application on July 29th of 2019. We had been talking with the codes department for several months. We went to planning uh, for the tower Thing. We came to this board uh, for a zoning variance for the sidewalk uh, that you recall, but our, our first building permit application and, and codes of zone records show July 29th is when we submitted our application. Uh, Ms. Smith just testified to that, that uh, the councilman sent out a notice on August 1st, so he's clearly within his 30 days as required by the code. We'd submitted a, a final and complete application to the codes department on July 29th. Um, the codes department took 98 days to review our application. Uh, everything we submitted, not at one point, the Coast Department suggests anything we put in there is inaccurate, question us, ask for clarification, anything. And the permit was issued, as the Zoning Administrator talked about, three months ago. Three months ago, November 6th. Um, Ms. Uh, Smith used the word stay or hold. This board lacks any authority to do so. Our clients did install foundation as was required under their contract but we have chosen not to pursue construction until this endeavor here is over with. Um, so there's not any sort of stay in that. And uh, one of the things uh, Ms. Smith brought up as well is uh, the NEPA report. A NEPA report was performed. A NEPA was provided to the not only the codes department, but the legal department when they asked for a copy of it. That's the environmental impact. Yes, sir, it is. And I, I've, I've actually got a copy of it with me. Uh, this, is, this is the NEPA report. I did not make nine copies of this. but. Uh, Metro government has a link to all this data. It's, it's so large I don't even staple it. It's over 300 pages. Uh, all of that's done. The FCC requires that to be done. And we've performed those tests and done what the federal government requires of us. Uh, included in that is, is consultation with the Hermitage. SCI actually initial application was a 150 foot tower. We lowered it 10 feet. Uh, and I made that announcement here in front of this board on August 1st. Uh, at the request of the Hermitage. 
to do that. So we further reduce the tower in that case. Uh, members, I, I just want to remind you guys that the burden of proof is on Ms. Smith, Ms. Smith alone. It's not on SCI, it's not on the Codes Department. Our client has a validly, legally issued permit that follows all aspects of the law. We've submitted into this record not only PowerPoints from Verizon showing as to why they located here, uh, and also you know, the, the information uh, addressing uh, uh, perspective decrease of property value, which just is not the case. I've submitted into this board a record of a study done in North Carolina about a very tower site and went through several rounds of litigation. Uh, in the conclusion of that study, there's, there's no effect, uh, but it's constantly stated in hearings I attend across the state uh, that there's an effect on property value. There's not been one study ever proposed that shows that to be the case. And I've submitted that into this record uh, with your own, with Metro's own data to show that that's not the case uh, in, in that instance. But, looking back through uh, the rest, I, I, again, I submitted a document that covered all 12 points. Uh, I wanted to be sure to cover the points that Ms. Smith brought today of the individual code sections upon which this board could revoke a permit. Uh, none of the other two-thirds of her document are, are valid reasons which they could be revoked. And given I don't have a rebuttal, I'm here for any questions that you have of me. The, it, the mic, it, it, we're at the school board. It's live. The mics are live all the time. So That's just, just even pull it. Worse. Yeah, exactly. Just pull it, pull it down, and ready to go. Joey, you, sure. your client has said that they rise and wants to put the tower here. Is there some shortage of coverage in that area of town? And I'm looking at your client, so I mean, I'm not. Yes. No. Yeah. Well, I, I would say the client is the builder of the tower. Or ten, yep. Verizon would be the tenant. But there, there is a shortage. And the issue is, is deals with capacity. Uh, so much so in America, at least in this part of the country, it's not so much a coverage issue where my phone will not make a call. I have no bars. I have no signal. Uh, you don't run into that too much in this part of town. What you do have is the lack of, of capacity to handle that data back and forth. It, more and more, it's data. It's not necessarily making that phone call. Um, and capacity is, if you've ever been somewhere, if you've been to a Titans game or the balls or somewhere, Preds, um, where you've got all four bars, but that text won't go through or that web page won't open, that's a capacity issue. That there's literally not enough bandwidth to handle those requests back and forth. And that data, ladies and gentlemen, it's, we're, we're over 50% of folks that have uh, mobile phones only, no landlines. Data growth has grown exponentially in the last 10 years, and it's going to continue to do so. Um, so that the need for these towers to be located in residential areas are, are, are more and more going to be uh, prevalent, uh, not just in Nashville, but, but everywhere. And, and, it, and it relies upon the fact that because the homeowners have, have gotten rid of the landline and they do their internet exclusively by mobile or they're surfing or posting or Tweeting Framing or whatever, yes, sir. I mean, that's it's it's data, and that's what's driving the need for these towers. Um, so if you've if you've been downtown and seen the little black towers going up all over the sidewalks, that's that's increased capacity and bandwidth needed for those. Well, I <clears throat> excuse me, if I may, I want to ask a question: Is there a chance that, say, Verizon can work with AT and T? And this shows my ignorance about it. I'm asking a question sure. because I don't know. But is it not possible for Verizon to say buy time from an ATT tower? Is there any such thing as that? Towers. Um, this tower is designed for co-locations. So uh, towers. It's not so much that AT&T and Verizon um, share bandwidth, but they do locate on the same towers together. So you'll see those. And and what I submitted in this record, we are we're already on towers in the in the area. Um, uh, we talk about that. To give you a little bit how the how the system works, the RF engineers look for places that they need increased capacity or increased coverage. Uh, so when I say coverage, I'm meaning capacity in that in that regard, uh, and and look for those spots. And they employ folks like SCI to go find locations in those areas that meet the local regulations and and can do those. And but it's it's the carriers want to co-locate together because it's clearly it's cheaper to, to build a tower once than to build each carrier builds their own tower and be too close together. But well, This is not part of your report, but I just got back from the trip to North Carolina and I noticed two towers on the main interstate that they had enhanced by putting greenery as though it were a tall tree 
and it was disconcerting, really, to see a tree that large up right. in the air. Well, and, and, and I, I, I do address, and it's in the ordinance, and I, I submitted to that. Um, we, we proposed monopole tower because we believe that a single pole is less visually intrusive than a pine tree or pipe cleaner. Some folks have described it as those. Where a, 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 a tree that's 140 feet that's with no... Big. No other trees of that height, nor the, the 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 makeup of that tree being evergreen, would make no sense at this site. Uh, That's that this would how be. I felt. It was and, and the other right. part too of this tower, this tower will have no lighting. Uh, the the FAA does not require towers to be lighted, unless they're over 200 feet in height. Uh, it, so only towers at 200 feet and above require lighting, or towers that may be right near an airport. Um, you know, the FAA can require lighting of a tower under 200 feet if it's if it's within one of their approach vectors. Uh, but this this tower is not intended to be lighted or anything of that nature. Um, again, I just uh, in whatever time I've got left, I just want to emphasize again we we fully met the requirements of this ordinance. Um, I do I do emphasize with Miss Smith. I, I do I do run into neighbors and folks opposed to towers across the state. I understand where they come from, um, and. And you've got a letter from from Councilman Hager um, at addressing the ordinance. That's my suggestion to you. But the, the ordinance at the time this this permit's issued is what it is, and our our clients fully comply with it. So you should uphold the zoning administrator. Any other questions for for uh, I say the the representative of the permit holder. <laughs> it, um, okay. If no questions, then we will hear back. Uh, from the item A applicant who has a minute and 45 seconds for rebuttal. All right, number one, he says his breakpoint technology um, meets the ordinance. 85 feet away from, a, it's supposed to fall at 85 feet, but it's a 140 foot tower. And I hope you saw in your exhibits in letter exhibit E that these things fall. I, I created a video for you of 25 states in the United States where these towers fell straight over. They would land in our yards. Number two, it is all Levog owned property. It was owned by Levog. He sold it to Speedway 600 feet. I said it was feet away. It's too small for too short of a distance. Number three, um, the exhibit G that I point you to for the Realtors Association, those letters, the uh, actually the American Realtor Association does say that there is a 20% decrease in property values on average. Number four, uh, page 32 of the legal brief um, describes how we have to have, where we deserve to have um, alternate sites. There are no existing towers, he says. Guess what? There are 36 towers or cellular antennas within a two-mile radius of this thing, and that is of um, Exhibit J. As I just said, there's so much more information there. Um, I did not and was not aware I was not notified that there was a full uh, NEPA uh, report. I was told that there was perhaps a shortened one, but not a full. I would love to see that. And then also alternative sites. We have never been told of the alternative sites as the Metro ordinance says that we can uh, and have in our right uh, have a right to hear. And so I just ask you to look, yes, at these ordinances and see where if this thing falls, if breakpoint technology fails, as I show you in exhibits E, I, D and E, I just would ask that you would consider that lives can be lost. So, so if we've got a, a landowner who's saying, I'm willing to negotiate an equitable exit for them, and we've got a local business that is within uh, the area who's willing to take it, it would benefit them financially. And you can save our property values, not to mention the health concerns we've not named here today, purposely because they violate the Telecommunications Act of 1996. That is a win-win-win, and I ask you to rule in our favor. They have somewhere else to go. We do not. All right. Is, is there any additional questions for the applicant? All right. We will thank you. We'll close the public hearing. Um, and, all, right. all right. We'll ask for order while we discuss. Um, thank you. Thank you. I guess the, the question I have for the, the zoning administrator that 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 I don't know that we're raised by 
Mr. Hargis or, or responded to because we didn't ask, but she mentioned alternative sites. Is there a requirement for a cell tower applicant to provide alternative sites? The, the city law talks about it in the Metro Code. That's been correctly stated. The state law also contemplates the absence of a need, the pointed absence of a need to demonstrate um, any sort of justification for the radio frequency need. And, of course, state law controls to the extent there's a conflict between the two. I believe that is actually addressed in the – and I know it's a voluminous case record for this particular case, and it would be easy to miss one specific detail. But I believe that was addressed in the brief submitted – and I'm calling it a brief – the documents titled Statement of Compliance with the Metro National Zoning Ordinance submitted by a council, Mr. Hargis, for the appellants – or applicants, rather – indicating that to the extent there is that conflict, state law governs, and therefore there is no actual need to present the list of other sites that were contemplated at that point. Okay. Because, of, because the, and I, I do remember that, and I think it, uh, yes, yeah, state law is unambiguous and crystal clear. No local or county government can require the applicant for wireless telecommunication services to provide that there's a radio frequency need. That, that's what you're... That is the reference, and I think that's a reference to TCA 1324-305-1424-402, of course, speaks to a lot of this as well. So those are the two sections that were contemplated there. So in the code staff opinion, that that if whatever, require, whatever requirement the applicant here was stating was overridden by state law. <coughs> That's my understanding, yes. Okay. What about from the, the rest of the board thoughts, questions, issues? I guess I'm confused about the notice. When uh, Mr. Hargis just presented us with <coughs> a copy of what was the notice that was in the Tennessean, and we did hear that there was an adequate notice, but <coughs> that is considered adequate notice to publish in the local newspaper. Well, and it sounded like the burden was on the council member, that the, the code required <laughs> notification to the council member, which um, I'm assuming happened, I don't know that we've heard directly, but the council member sent out a message with, we know the council member sent out a message within 30 days about the first hearing, which at least put people on notice about the cell tower. Right. It, the most concise way to look at it is this, the notice requirement. Yeah, yeah and, and the public hearing is closed, and we were all here for that hearing, so we're aware of what it was for. The application for the tower was submitted on July the 29th. That's the trigger date for the timing of the notice to the council member. The council member had already consulted with the codes department director, with me as a zoning administrator and other members of the codes department staff, for particulars about the project well before that application. Constructive notice was achieved throughout the summer, long before the application for the tower itself was actually made. As this board knows, and as was discussed by both parties here today, um, there was a sidewalk variance request that tracked on this also. All of that had its own public meeting and other discussions. However, the notice was achieved. The council member did choose to have a neighborhood meeting, did send out a notice for, notice for such. I think the testimony before the board today, and I attended neither meeting, but the testimony before the board is that a meeting, a meeting took place on August 8th, a second meeting took place on August 22nd, both well within any 30-day window of the July 29th filing of the application for the tower. And then I guess there was there was testimony that the meeting um, that, that represented it, it was testified to that representatives for the permit holder were present at, at both meetings. Um, there was frustration expressed that the answers that all the answers weren't there. And so, is there any? I mean, does, does yeah? I mean, is, is does one have to be satisfied with the answers? in order to have that criteria met. The exact statement under law, and I'm just going to read law to you so you can kind of okay. judge for yourself. This is from 1716.080 Part C. Num um, again, that's 080 C 
four E Roman numeral five notification, the last sentence in that long paragraph reads as follows. If a meeting is held, the applicant shall attend and provide information about the tower safety, technical necessity, visual aspects, and alternative tower sites and designs considered. We've already talked about the tower sites questions, of course, Mr. Chairman, but that sentence does not give any overt statement or even implied statement of the need for uh, meeting attendees to be fully satisfied with the information they've received or, or pleased with the project or anything along those lines. The, 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 the information should be shared to the ability that it can be shared. Um, provide the information. Right. Okay, and, and again, I just, uh, I mean, when I look at these, it's just kind of out of respect for both sides, just try to pinpoint to myself what, what are the, what are the potential uh, arguments that, that uh, you know, might have teeth and, and, and make sure that I've explored those in, at least in my head uh, enough to know um, what I think about it. Well, and I think what I would say is I, I don't like it when state law overrides local law. That's one of my pet peeves, especially land use laws. But you know, our job here is that we don't get to change the law. We have to determine whether the zoning administrator enforced it correctly. And and I looked at the materials and, and listened, and our, our uh, role here is so very narrow, and I, I don't – Again, it, it's not that I necessarily agree with the law about cell towers or um, the state law, but I don't think the zoning administrator erred. And that then. Uh -oh. Well, I have that same sad conclusion. I have great sympathy for these neighbors. I can't imagine having this happen next door to me. It would be horrifying. I would be afraid of the tower falling. We may get told it'll crunch, but I'd be afraid it's going to fall over on me. Uh, but I agree with you. Um, I don't see an out here because the law is very clear and the administrator has to administer that law, not what we wish that it were. I'm, yeah, we'll close. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm still... I'm not trying to change the law. I'm a little bit different than you guys. I mean, this is going to provide a service for a lot of people. The notices were given. I haven't heard anything from legal. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm going to aim in your direction. I always do this to y'all. Uh, but I haven't heard anything that says that the folks that were proposing the cell tower there have done anything in contravention or violating any of the existing regulations, ordinances, or laws that are out there. Why are we, I mean, I'm looking at you and you're sort of shaking. I'm, there's nothing that you've seen in your review of this that would lead you to a conclusion that there's a violation of law anywhere, correct? Correct. Okay. Well, that made my decision a whole lot easier. I don't normally, but right. call the question. Thoughts? Just opportunity, you know, you can say no. No, <laughs> I, just, I, I was just want to make sure everybody has a chance to, to say something if they'd like. I actually agree with Ms. Sanford because I do think um, no matter what we might personally feel about it and all of the work I know that the neighbors have put into organizing their community for this, we don't really have any discretion. The law is very narrow, as um, Mr. Pepper said, and we have to decide whether or not the zoning administrator err in reading through the briefs and reading through all the material, I don't know if there's any evidence that he did, so I, don't, I couldn't vote against it. And, and, and I think it may be a different, uh, it might very well be a different vote if uh, we said, do we think it's a, you know, a great idea or good for the neighborhood or something like that, but that's, uh, that's sadly not our, our position. Our position is to say, is this, uh, were the rules followed and were they followed uh, it, it correctly. That's what this is. Right. So, is there? Does someone There's have a, a motion? I will move that the zoning administrator did not err. And I'll second. 
I have a motion, I have a second. Is there any other discussion on the motion? All in favor of the motion say aye. Raise your hand. Any opposed? That motion passes. Next case. Next case for the board to consider is case 2020-005 involving property at 104 DeSoto Drive. If I could please ask the audience to be quiet so we can move on to the next case, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Um, this is a request for a variance from side, rear, and building coverage restrictions in order to allow three existing um, sheds, carports that were built, with, built without a permit. Is the applicant Rolando Lopez here? Y'all can go ahead and come forward to the table. This is the zoning map before you now showing the zoning of the property is RS10. Again, if I could ask the, the audience to be quiet. Thank you. Aerial photography showing you the surrounding area. This is the site plan that was submitted by the applicant showing the existing sheds and carport. And finally, the uh, current photographs of the property as well as up and down the street. Is there anyone here in opposition to case five? Seeing none, you'll have five minutes to make your presentation. <coughs> Just please be sure to identify yourself by name and address. I'm going to be kind of waiting. That's fine. You just, that's fine. Hi. <laughs> I'm Crystal Lopez. I am his daughter, Rolando Lopez, and I'll be translating for him. Okay. Um, so we really don't, I mean, we understand that there's some restrictions on what he had built, and they told us that he had to go down on some feet like uh, build down, but we really don't understand much of what they explained to us. And um, on the, I know that on the um, carport, they had told them that he had to make it, um, that it couldn't be as wide. But the thing is, what the feet that they're asking him to reduce it to, that would not allow his truck to be able to drive in. So the, the carport you're talking about is the, is 13 feet wide? Is that, is that the one that's on the left to attach to the house? Could you explain, maybe I think it, if you would tell us, uh, describe these buildings, I, I think we have an aerial photo um, that I think is right after maybe this one. Well, well there's, one in, there's one in our packet that uh, you may not have because it's it's a little different. That is a little closer map that has the carport circled and the shed, the two sheds circled. So there's one shed that's right behind the carport. Right. And um, that shed is um, guarding his two boats, his two water boats. Um, and then the one to. The is it just a covered shed, or the, are there walls? On, or is there is there a wall well, and a door, or is it? Just a two, four posts and a roof. So it's four posts and a roof, and there's like a two mini doors like this. So it's not a whole door covering the whole thing, but it's all open. There's no walls. There's no. Okay. And then how about what is what is the other shed? The other shed is for he has a 1973 GMC that he's had for more than 30 years, um, right. more than 40 years. I'm sorry, and um, he has that to guard it. Um, I know that. Is it also not covered? I mean, is it also that no one wall? has the walls and it, it is a covered porch? I mean, would it be considered a room or is it a more like a carport? It's like a, a carport, I guess you could say. Okay. And how long have how long have all these structures been there? Cuánto tiempo llevan las estructuras ya hechas? About seven years. Okay. Um, I don't, <laughs> so he's just saying that the boat storage that he built, um, it was just destroying the boats. Like by the time summer came and stuff, we weren't able to, he wasn't able to enjoy them because it kept raining on them and you know, water kept going where it wasn't supposed to be, and that's why he built it, but that's why he made it an open one so it wouldn't be an issue to anybody. Um, the other one isn't an issue either because it's not even close to um, his house line, his property line. Given, um, 
take into consideration that he's also, ¿cuántos pies más tiene la vieja de? No, 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 yo tengo, yo le subí a mi cerco, uh -huh. dos pies de cerco. Yo sí, hice la cerca, uh -huh. pero se ve así pegado, pero la cerca mía tiene como dos pies más para allá. So he's to, he actually gave, when he built the fence area for the property line, he actually robbed himself of two feet so that she could have comfortable space, the next door neighbor. And then um, just the carport is as well when he needs to do, you know, if he has to fix his truck or something, it's just a shaded place so he doesn't have to be out in the rain or he doesn't have to be, you know, out in the heat. <coughs> Are there any, any questions right now? And it looks like the property behind you is interstate? Yeah, it's interstate. Okay. So you don't have a back neighbor, and then it, no. have you taught, do you have any information from the neighbor on the driveway so side? So if you're looking at the house this way, like looking right at the house, the left neighbor, they get along just fine with us. The right neighbor we thought got along just fine with us. You know, her trees were growing onto his backyard. He took into that into consideration that she was elderly, she couldn't do stuff. So he had people cut it down as well when they were cutting down his tree lines and stuff. But just from a time back, it's just been issues and issues and issues. So, but if you're looking at the, at the, so you say if you're looking at the house, the one to the left, and that's the the house that's closest to the, the carport. boat shed and the carport. Yeah, that neighbor, have, yeah, that we, neighbor doesn't have an issue with no, your carport or your shed. No, we have no issues with okay. them at all. Okay. And like I said, the one that is um, the little storage that is guarding his uh, old older truck, um, it's still it's not off of the fence line, and from the fence line, he still has two more feet into her house or onto her property. Is that the one to the right? Yeah. Okay. Well, and you got a lot of, you have several issues here, uh, and some are setback, meaning that's too close to the line, and others are, uh, it looks like, uh, building coverage restrictions, which means there's, there may be too much on the, too much coverage on the property. And so the, the shed to the right may, uh, be in violation because of the coverage issue rather than the setback i don't know uh, okay. we don't i don't have a map that our, our information doesn't tell us exactly what yeah. um exactly what building uh is kind of in violation of what rule okay um yeah they didn't tell us anything they just told us it was for these three you know right. constructed areas you've got too much and it's too close and that we got to figure that out all right, is, are there any other questions right now? Is there anything else that you'd like to add? Yeah, they just told them. Um, when the inspector actually went to go see it, um, he measured and he, my dad explained the same to him and the guy was like, well, you know, I don't see an issue. He said, but we, st we were still called out here and we have to do our job. Okay. All right, anything else? All right, we'll close the public hearing. The, the cases that where something's been around for a long, long time that all of a sudden become an issue uh, more often than not tend to be uh, interpersonal related. Um, there is an, there is an opposition. Yeah. Yeah, there was, the was there opposition yeah. present here? No, no there's a letter of, yeah, yeah no, there's I'm a letter of opposition to the um, it's on Interstate 24 in Jenny Walsh's district. Opposition says they live in the neighborhood. They live in the Park. neighborhood. 132 Sturton. 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 They live on Sturton, and which I don't see on the map, but they're not. They're not the neighbor. They're not a neighbor that adjoins the property. Unless they're on the other side of the interstate, 440. Yeah, they're not a neighbor that, I mean, I don't, no, no disrespect for the opposition, but they're not a, a directly impacted neighbor. Has he created it? Oh, we closed it yet? Yeah, we're close to public hearing. 
I mean, one of the, you know, the, I, I tell you, I, 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 the carport, it, it's, it's, I would say not, uh, not a given, but it's not uncommon at all. In fact, it is fairly common that carports like that, um, because the house is so close to, you know, and the driveway is right on the property line, uh, that carports uh, we approve as long as they're not enclosed, um, because it, it, especially if the neighbor uh, who's um, immediately there uh, is um, is an impacted, and at least the one shed, um, the white shed that is in the far left, uh, seems to be of the same nature, a, a carport that's not enclosed that's covering uh, property. And so I, I don't have an issue with those. I really don't have an issue with the other shed. Uh, I think it probably contributes to the lot coverage issue, but uh, we don't have that, that specific data. Uh, because it, again, it sounds like that that shed is is not. Uh, and I mean, it's it's totality. It's just not. Uh, that's the only kind of really enclosed space. Only. So I I, I don't really. So I'm assuming that some somebody essentially reported this after seven years. Is that's the only assumption. I mean, I I don't. I, think, I don't ever like that because I don't. I just don't. But. Um, I like to see some hardship. I mean, whether it's been seven days or seven years, and I'm struggling with that. To me, that I think that the the carport is an easy one for hardship for me because it's the location of the driveway, and and there's a long history of the board allowing carports, uh, non enclosed carports, uh, where the driveway uh, goes down the side of the house, and you don't enclose it. Uh, with the condition that it's never enclosed, uh, then you're not uh, creating a situation where someone could enclose a room and add on an, an air conditioning, you know, HVAC, uh, their space, and it uh, becomes a room that's on the property line. It truly is two poles and a roof. Uh, and so, well, the other, the others. Forgiveness and not permission. Well, and, you know, the, you know, I think that the, the white shed again. I have I, here. Here's here's where I'm, my logic on it, and you can tell me if it holds or doesn't. And it may very well not, but the the logic on the white shed is that it's a, it's at the you know the driveway goes straight through. It's a way to get the boats in and out. Uh, it's you know at the very back of the property. It certainly doesn't offend the back neighbors because it's the interstate, uh, and I think the hardship is the location. I think if you're going to have a covered area for your boat, then it, it's, that's just where it, it needs to be. Uh, you know, the, the other shed, I think it's a, probably the lot size coverage, and I think it relates to the white shed. Uh, I mean, I think it's, it's if, if the white shed wasn't there, then the shed to the right may not even be at, at question. Um, because I think given their testimony of having an additional two feet, uh, and, ha and, and having some uh, at least conflicting testimony. You now, we don't have a survey, but at least their testimony is that they don't believe that that shed on the right is a setback issue. Then I think that uh, it really is, to me, do you believe the other, the carport and the other shed are reasonable? And if they are, then I think the third shed falls into place. But like I said it might be a stretch, but that's. Well, y'all are the lawyers. Y'all might not give me a good grade if I was in law school making that case, but that's my. We hope you're smart enough not to go to law school. Yeah, that's, that's right. He was. But that's yeah. uh, so maybe a unique feature too is that it this property has basically an interstate running through the backyard. It's, that's what it's I was not. Say. It doesn't even back. There's not even an alley or another street separating it from another neighborhood. It's a. I think it is unique. You know, there's only a certain percentage of properties in Davidson County that have an interstate adjoining the backyard. So I think, to me, that that quells a lot of my concerns about <coughs> neighbors behind, you know, being in an up, you know, being in their on their second floor and looking down and seeing seeing it and being bothered by it. So I agree with Mr. Pepper. I think that the interstate 
sort of creates a unique quality for this particular property and creates a hardship. And I'm comfortable granting the variances as requested. Okay. If you'll make that a motion, I'll second it. I make a motion that we approve the requested variances due to the hardship of the interstate creating a unique quality for this particular lot. And would you accept an amendment that the carport and uh, boat should not be enclosed? Yes, I accept that amendment and add that to my motion. I have a motion. Is there a second? I will second. I have a motion. I have a second. Is there any discussion? My only comment was <coughs> nobody's complained in seven right. years. Hmm. That just that's a personal, and I'm not going down that road. Of it, it won't be the first case you hear like that, I promise. No, I <laughs> I've been on this more that. lineup. And I'll make the exact right. same comment each particular time. If it was seven days, it's right. a whole different ball game. Right, exactly. All right, so we have a motion, oh, have a question. second. All right, any other comments? All in favor, say aye. Uh -huh. Any opposed? Great. Good luck. Thank you. Oh, what does that mean? I'm uh, sorry. It means, it means that you're that you, you get to keep your, that, that, that you're okay, but you can't enclose the, the carport or the boat shed that, that you, you describe those as being a open, carport yeah. and open they just have to stay open if you decide at some point in time you want to cover those then you have to come back to this board and ask permission all right thank you so much absolutely yeah, yeah. No and we'll take a quick break break all right take a quick five minute break and then we'll be hey thank you don't <laughs> no. Four involving case at 1033 Wedgwood Avenue, number six. This is a request for variances from the step back height in the build to zone, maximum height, primary entrance location, glazing, and building frontage requirements in the RM 20A district. This is in order to complete the construction of the sixth unit in a six unit building. Before you is a zoning map showing the zoning of the property is RM 20A. The uh, Unit at issue is the one that's not highlighted in red, but six up there, I believe, that's got the RM20A over it. The one, that, the one that's closest to Wedgwood? That's right. This is the area of photography, giving you a sense of the surrounding area. This is the site plan submitted by the applicant, and finally, the current conditions of the property. Is there anyone here in opposition to Case 24? Seeing none, you'll have five minutes to make your presentation. Please be sure to identify yourself by name and address. My name is Baird Graham. Uh, this is 1033 Wedgwood. I'm a Nashville native, live in Green Hills, went to Hillsborough High School. I've been here my whole life. I've been building for 15 years um, with Metro. So the, the, the reason I'm asking for this is not because we are trying to change something. We pulled our permit, I'd have to check and see, months and months ago uh, to do this building. I've been pulling permits for 15 years with Metro. I've never had any issues. I've never had a job shut down. I have great relationship with everyone, but we pulled this permit. It went through review numerous times. It states on the master permit, six units, four stories. Um, we, are, we were obviously unaware of the zoning. Um, and so it was approved and we went to construction and went to building and I guess I got a call six weeks ago from Chuck Hayes, my building inspector, and he called me and said, Baird, this is kind of odd, but I've got to shut your building down or your job site on Wedgwood down. And it freaked me out. And so, you know, came down to codes and finally got an answer on what had happened. And somehow it, would, it had been reviewed and numerous times and sent back, and we've sent back and got it all passed uh, for what we were doing. We were just building the building as we were approved, and then we got stopped. And so now I have four stories on the first unit. It's obviously framed in, um, windows, we've got, the roof is on, and I was told to stop, and they ended up not stopping all five of my units, because none of those are in opposition. It's the first unit, um, because of the zoning that we were unaware of, and that was approved and passed by codes, we built four stories instead of the two or whatever is required by zoning. So at this point, I am hundreds of thousands of dollars into what I've got now, and I've been stuck for, I guess, six weeks, haven't slept, and since they told me this, and I had to do, you know, uh, appeal for all this, and so now that, that's why I'm here. My hardship is that, you know, I deal with Metro all the time, um, pulling permits, and this was just turned in as any other 
building applicant and it was reviewed numerous times and we corrected things and it was all stamped and approved and we did what we were approved to do and then again I was halted and I'm kind of here. I don't know if you you can provide this answer but it may, it may be uh, the code folks but can you help us understand or someone help us understand just kind of exactly where the offenses are here or you know it, and I mean I know it was caught at some point after the permit was issued and and that isn't the first time we've heard you know had that uh, I mean it's not common at all but it's there are times you know at least in my years here it's not every even every year but there are times when this has happened um, but really want to know um, what kind of the, the the height I know it says the maximum height is 45 feet and we were approved but, at 47, I believe, five or so. And they're 47, but it's and it, but then it also says maximum height is 30 feet at the bill two zone. Or is that a, a violation? Yes, sir. I mean, I guess the, the variances are uh, step back height in the bill two zone, maximum height, primary entrance location. I mean, is there? Do we know what kind of what the offenses are? So the maximum height in the build two zone is 30 is 30 feet and they are request the current height in the build two zone is 47 feet two inches and the, do we know how far I mean I know with the build the step back of the I'm sorry what were you gonna ask well how, how far like the build two zone it, it kind of steps back though right there's a required 15 foot minimum step back and they there is no step back here so they're asking to have that buried as well so they they don't step back and then go up; they just go sh straight up. Okay. I mean, obviously, um, we would have if. Sorry. Go ahead. If if I mean we would have, uh, I wouldn't have built this like that. I mean, again, I live in the neighborhood. This is we're trying to you know do our job right. and be you know. Okay. Uh, yeah. Let, let me. Can we? Let, I, I get that, but let me. I want to get the facts of like what right. what what so are the other all the offenses? issues? Are the um, overall height maximum is forty five feet? So again, this goes over that by two feet two inches. Um, there's a requirement that the primary entrance, that a requirement of a primary entrance along the building front facade within the build two zone. And that is, there's no primary entrance within, on the front facade of the building or on the facade of the building that's within the build two zone. Um, there's a 25% minimum glazing requirement. Um, and then there's also a percentage of the facade along the, there's a 60 foot, I'm sorry, 60% minimum of the facade must, I'm sorry, I'm butchering this explanation. There's a, the facade has to cover 50, 60% of the parcel frontage. That's the minimum. And do we so, know what, what it does or? Um, you may be able to answer that better than I can. I, it, I mean, it covers that, the front does. It's. And then what about the 25% glazing? Do we know what? That one, we, we do not, I do not have in it now. I mean, that's no problem um, if this is, I mean, I would go back and have to add the glazing and make the building actually look like a true front elevation facing Wedgwood. Okay. At our door entry and our, our glazing requirements. So you could you could accomplish the glazing. And then do you say, do you think that you have the building frontage requirements or no? Yes, sir. I'm 100% I'm we do. I don't believe we're, unless I'm missing something. This is based on the information that we got from our building inspector out in the field. So okay. That, that I'm just going on the information that I have. Okay, so so the, the main concerns are the step back, the height, and then the entrance. And I guess I don't I, I don't understand the orientation of, of this to know what the entrance issue is. I'm not sure if it entrance issue, I'm not sure what that would be because the, the entrance is actually through the alley and um, you know, we donated right away in the front and gave away any entrance off of Wedgwood so to, to reduce any traffic or not have people pulling out right there. Um, so okay. there's an alley entrance that we're... And so does the requirement want him to have an entrance on Wedgwood or...? Uh, with Just within the build two zone. And so I don't know if that's on the Wedgwood side or on this. Yeah, I guess that would be on the Wedgwood side. Oh, and I see. Okay, you know what? This is this is a much, thank you for this because this is a better perspective because it it's only one side of it's the side of the building that faces Wedgwood, and that's why the bill two zone is from Wedgwood, and that's why the issue is only in that number six. That's right. Okay, and that's also why 
I guess how our um, inspector determined that he didn't meet the 60% of the frontage requirements. So the building has to cover 60% of the frontage on Wedgwood. I see. And so that one, all right, so that, and that one, it, you know, conceivably could be, if, if we were to, to say there was a hardship for frontage, is that it's a narrow, but based on the orientation, it's a narrow lot um, for this type of RM20 development. Um, uh, if, if, and then the, but I guess the, in, in the, I'm sorry, the entrance again, because I mean, it seems like the entrance is that if, if you're entering off an alley, the build two zone is the area, the side that faces Wedgwood. So if you're building within that build two zone, you have to have a primary entrance. So there has to be a primary entrance that faces Wedgwood. Okay. That's that's easily. Well, I'm, I'm just, I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm just trying to understand because I mean, per personally, I, I, I go down Wedgwood all the time and if you can decrease, I, I think you probably have an awful lot of folks who would say you, if you didn't have an entrance on Wedgwood, that would be a, a happy thing, um, especially if you had another way to get there. That was, um, but anyway, that's that's. But I, like I said again, trying to understand. So it really is because of the orientation. And then, do we have any idea why? I mean, it was it was it just a, an oversight. Uh, it that, was. That, um, so part of the issue is that this is the new alternative district, and the alternative district has. Um, design guidelines basically that are unique to alternative dis districts such as glazing such right. as where the primary entrance is located and it, it just it's not um, it's just it was just an oversight it was a design guideline that right but in terms of the height and the other issues uh, units one through five have no issue right I mean those Correct. those are 47 feet or whatever however tall they are they're they're, they're not, they're not in they're not in violation, it's just unit six that's closest to Wedgwood. That's right. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. I did. No problem. That's what I'm here for. Is that everybody? Even if I do stumble over my words about have any 60 questions on frontage requirements. <laughs> well, sometimes it. I mean, and, and you, we've even talked a little bit about it, you know, before on the consent agenda. Although we knew it had so many, it, it wasn't really eligible because it had so many uh, requests, uh, which is why we didn't dig into it deeper. But. It, it still takes a while. Everybody can understand what we're talking about now. I, I, I've caught up with y'all. Where we all got it? All right. So, I, I guess I'd, I mean I can understand. Uh, I, I can imagine a hardship on some of these, um, you know, building entrance. Uh, You're, you're not asking for any setbacks. I mean, you're. No, sir, not at all. Again, you know, we just. Or that's a, that's the bill too. But the, that's a step yeah, back. The step back, step back, yeah. I guess. I mean, that's where, again, it was approved at, at codes and through planning. We went through reviews. It was submitted to us. We fixed what they asked for. We resubmitted. It got approved, got stamped, and we were building as to what we were approved to do. If, obviously, if that would have ever come up, we would have, I mean, we would have never done that. There's, I just, I don't want to go wasting my time and extra hundreds of thousands of dollars in lumber and material and labor and everything else to have to get to a stopping point, obviously, and come in here and have to try to appeal something that I wasn't even aware of. I and mean, this caught me so off guard. Um, I've been sick to my stomach for the last six weeks again. I, I didn't even sleep last night waiting to come to this right. meeting just because of the um, anxiety this caused. You know, right. we're, we're an honest, you know, humble building company. And I'm not, you know, wasn't doing anything out of um, from what I was approved. And it's just an unfortunate situation that's got me put in a, uh, a heck of a bind for the front. But I can truly make the front look very well acceptable for the neighborhood um, and make it, you know, the glazing and the front entry and everything, um, the facade to, you know, to tie in with the neighborhood. You know, the building on 12th and Wedgwood is the old, I can't remember what the actual building, but it's a huge high rise right next door that's, I mean, just monstrous. I mean, if, you know, if you're looking for- You talking about the one that's shaded there on the drawing? Uh, no, sir. Ne just next. Yes, sir. On the left, the big shaded yeah. um, oh, no. property. Are that you saying it's story. taller than oh, yours? Oh, it's huge. It's a big, probably twenty-story concrete, huge building. It's been there forever. The, oh, okay. I know where you are. Big, All right. I mean, but there's a lot of land, though. It's not correct. There right. is. There is. And then going back to the street frontage part with the sixty percent, I see what y'all are saying now because I was unaware of that. So you're close to twelfth. Yes, sir. It's it's right. All right. Right there. It's the first building off of. <coughs> when you take a ride on Wedgwood from 12th, um, past the big, tall um, building that's been here for as long as I've been here, so. 
um, okay. high school wise. I mean, it's not as you know big and gargantuous as, as the building next to it by any means. Okay. Is there anything else? Any other questions? I do have questions. Mike. Yeah. Let me move it over here. You're also asking for the 2.2 feet. That. Okay. <coughs> On the height. height. So, you, when you were designing it, did you just miss it? Well, we didn't know that there was a 45 foot height max. And that, that's, I mean, and obviously if we did, we wouldn't have submitted it to codes. I mean, it clearly states 47 foot, five inches. Um, and then Chuck Hayes, my building inspector, um, we actually measured them all. And if you really took the average of the property of the four corners and the height of the building, it would actually be under 47 feet. So the, the other, the, in the actual other five buildings, because I always cut down my crawl spaces and not have a bunch of steps to go up, we actually lowered the height so the other four, five uh, buildings that were approved aren't even 47. They're lower than, they're, you know, probably right at 44, give or take. So you're saying the topography is what caused that one to be? But not just, yes, sir, it is a little bit of the topography, but we were also just building, you know, to our code, and that front unit's the highest one elevation-wise, um, even though it slopes from right to left if you're facing it from Wedgwood. Okay. Any other any other questions? Did you have anything else to add? No, so I mean, again, Tom, just when you go back to, you know, the height question, it's something, you know, we miss. Yes, absolutely, we miss this. If I would have known, we never would have submitted it. You know, I would have been embarrassed to turn it in. Um, and, and, yeah, so this has just been a, I mean, it's, it's been um, kind of awful, to be honest. And I, we didn't, you know, we didn't come into this and submit plans and get them approved and start building. Um, to try and you know do this and not and slide by something we had you know no idea we got caught I mean with I mean just caught me out of surprise so bad like I said this has been a long six seven eight weeks or whatnot okay any other thing anything else I'll do whatever you guys all right. you know all right we will close public hearing so uh, I'm able in this one to to knock off a lot of times in these cases, it becomes a self-imposed hardship because somebody should have known before they had done it. I, I don't think that applies here because I think there was a oversight on the part of Metro. So I don't I don't view this as a self-imposed uh, hardship. The which under TCA thirteen seven two zero seven. authorize a variance if there's this catch-all <clears throat> by reason of exceptional narrowness, shallowness, or shape of a specific piece of property at the time of the enactment of the regulation, or by reason of exceptional topographic conditions, or lo lowercase 2i, other extraordinary and exceptional situation. I think that probably applies here. Yep. The, I, the, I mean, I, 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 I hear that <coughs> it was possible for the applicant to have figured this out, but it's also kind of the reason. I mean, the, it's it, Metro is supposed to be the backstop on this, and I don't think, I think it's just a, a, a <coughs> honest mistake on everybody's part, and the, I, I think that also the fact that it appears that there's probably a hundred thousand dollars worth of work that's gone into this. I mean, you've, it's it's all but dried in. Um, if, if there hadn't been so much work, would it be a other extraordinary, exceptional situation? Maybe not. Um, but um, and that's kind of what I'm thinking right now, but I, I'd like to hear from other members of the board. I, it's a, it's a, it's a, as you point out, yep. I think it's, we don't get many of these. And no. So I don't, uh, Plazing's where I've got the problem, because he said he did yeah. it. 
I'm, 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 no, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm happy I'm with like all him. the. I'm sorry. Yeah, I think he's. Uh, yeah, I, he said it, but I think it. Yeah, have to. Happy with all the variances, but the glazing, which he said he would he would meet on that side, which I think that's. I mean, that's big looks. He sat for six weeks. Yeah, I mean, I I pass that property a lot, and I, I've never looked at it. There's a, a lot of construction on this, in that area, and we've heard some cases on the other side of Wedgwood. Um, lot size variances and other variances uh, just as an other indication of it going uh, dense and, and multifamily and 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 tall um, I don't recall passing this one and saying wow what what's up with that I mean visually it's not uh, something that looks a lot different than some of the other things that are going on there uh, even though it's uh, it's it is higher than it's it's supposed to be so I'm I'm, I'm comfortable with with a variance for everything but the glazing and, and allow him to meet the 25% glazing requirement on, on the Wedgwood side. And and especially the, the primary insurance location, I, I, I understand the, the code, but that's a section of Wedgwood that just doesn't need a, another curb cut. So I'm, I'm happy for the applicant <coughs> entering that property through the alley. Just from a public safety perspective. That's your motion, right? Well, it was, I think it was Ross's motion, but. I'll let you have it. Well, so we're, for all the reasons that, that Mr. Pepper said, um, in terms of the, the law, then I'll move that we approve uh, all of the variants requested, um, other than the glazing uh, variants, which the applicant said uh, was not needed because he could meet the glazing requirements for the code. I'll second. I have a motion and a second. Ross, you want to. Uh, Is there any, discuss, any other additional discussion or thoughts? Um, I understand the reasons articulated for why you all are going to support this, but I would note that Council Member Sledge sent in his strong opposition against this particular Where, variance request. I didn't get that, and I didn't see it in my oh. packet. It's in an email. It's He just says, uh, this is the only one District 17 appeal before you on Thursday, case 2020-024. I am strongly against this appeal to try to ask for forgiveness for wedging in a unit that clearly did not fit properly in this lot. The unit should be torn down and rebuilt to standards. And I understand um, Mr. Pepper's argument that some of this was just an oversight and that it was an honest mistake and he is positioned it under the exceptional circumstances, which I understand, but I just don't agree. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, I, and I, I didn't see that letter. Uh, it didn't make it into the packet and I, and I didn't see my stack of letters here, which thank you for reminding me. But I guess the only thing that, you know, and again, I, I, it's, it's rare that I would uh, kind of vote against the, the council member's position, but I don't think this is a case of asking for forgiveness because I don't, I think the applicant clearly, in, in my opinion, the applicant had permission uh, or thought he had permission uh, through a permit that was uh, that was issued in error, and so I, I, I usual mistake at the start, but detrimental reliance. Well, and so so then I I look at, at it to say is it, you know, if it were truly asking for forgiveness, I would and saying hey I, I didn't even I didn't get the permit or, you know I submitted a permit that wasn't correct. You know I said I was going to build 40 and I built 47. You know then I think it's a whole different story to me, but. So, uh, so there, there's a motion and a second, and, and that was comments. Any other comments or thoughts on the motion? Then uh, all in favor of the motion, say aye and raise your hand. Any opposed to the motion? So that motion passes four to one. Thank you. Good luck. Before we move on to the next case, if I could please remind members of the public to turn their cell phones or devices off so the board can consider the remaining cases without interruption. Next case is case 2020-026 involving property at 1533 Arthur Avenue. This is a request for a variance from the driveway requirements to construct a single family residence. This is a zoning map showing you the zoning of the property is R6A. Aerial photography giving you a sense of the surrounding area. Site plan submitted by the applicant. And finally, the current conditions of the property as well as up and down the street. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 26? Seeing none, the applicant will have five minutes to make your desired presentation. Please be sure to identify yourself by name and address. Emily, will you put up the just the front, the picture of the front of the property? <coughs> that one. Is it, yeah, is it a lot or what, which, what is the property? I believe it's that lot um, in the, between the two houses, the white house and the tan house. So it's a, okay. Uh, hello, member of the boards. My name is Amir Hangehtar, 1533 Arthur Avenue. 
And this is regarding the permit uh, to build a house and which requires a, a driveway parking or garage. And the unique situation is here at that uh, on the entire street, there is either a back alley access, but for just three last lots, as you see, there is like, there is uh, no uh, alley access. So our neighbors, they have uh, designated this uh, driveway parking and in order to, for us to get also this uh, uh, building permit, there's a, we, are, we, are, we are asking for the variance for the driveway parking. And as I said, all this side of the street, they have valley, uh, alley backside access, and that white house next to the <coughs> left, that's the last house which has access to the alley. And from the, this lot to the end, uh, there is no uh, uh, back uh, access alley. And uh, uh, in this, is, this is street is uh, uh, kind of uh, well maintained. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. And uh, the, there is only a couple of old houses or vacant lots uh, which are like uh, available. And I've been like uh, working like uh, to get the, like a construction loan, but like we just find out that we need to apply for this uh, parking variance. So where, uh, I guess we see the alley there, so it doesn't, that, I mean, it, it kind of looks like it ends at your property, but not, I guess. It, it, the, the, the white property to the oh, left, I see. Yeah, it goes all the way to the, yeah, to the end. Yeah. And is that, what is, is that interstate behind you, or what is it's that? Right, yes, sir. So the only two uh, lots uh, next to us, they already have this uh, driveway parking. I, I, I assume they, they built their... Do you know if the lot next door, do you got a variance for that parking lot, or, or they, did they build it uh, before the... Uh, I'm lot? not sure. It was built, like, probably a few years ago. And what specifically, you, you don't have a, a, I mean, I can't see on your site plan where you want the parking uh, to be. The, the, the front of the construction is going to be uh, 19 square feet. And as uh, uh, you see next next door uh, lot, they have the same, like, uh, the same width as the house. So ours is going to be a proposed 19 uh, feet wide uh, driveway. But so we also, is like from 15 to 19, is this going to work for us? So it, would your parking be similar to the house to the right there? Is that what you're saying? No, in front, in, yeah, to the, to the, the, you see the, in front of the lot, the vacant lot, is going to be like a, a driveway. It'll be so, just like the driveway exactly, to the right. Yes, sir. Okay, it'll be within the grass strip. Exactly, and the, this, uh, the side way, these are like kind of very wide, so if you park the, the car in the, like, uh, as you see the neighbors, it won't be prevent uh, people from walking. Uh, or any, there won't be any uh, prevention for people walking. And I guess the, the, the code question is, it's, it's R6A, which doesn't allow parking, it doesn't allow front-loaded garages or parking like this in the... That's right. Those are, those are one of some of the design guidelines I referenced earlier that are <coughs> really just go to how it looks, basically. Um, and typically, in the A districts, parking is required to be behind the house. So the question before you now is if it can be in front of the house. With respect to parking in the right-of-way, that's an issue for public work. So y'all can give him permission to park in the front, but where that's located in the front, with respect to the right-of-way, public works would still have to sign off on. Is there is there a design, a, a home design you can build and have the parking? And have you looked at whether you can build something and have the parking in the rear? Uh, as I mentioned, uh, there is no ba uh, back alley access. It ends. Uh, I, I understand yeah. that, but you would. I mean, you could still come in and out of the driveway uh, and have your parking in the back, right? Uh, we were trying that, but uh, as I said, the, the alley ends uh, before it gets to the lot. Yeah. So you okay? No, I understand that, but I I even knowing that, is there not a design that you can? use that allows you to build a house, have a driveway with the parking in back. You we, obviously we, have to turn around and come back out. We could have design, but we don't have the access to the alley. 
The Ali. I, I, under, I understand that. Yeah. You're driving. You're talking about. Yeah, the I'm, side I'm, but, drive. but it, yeah. isn't there? Is there? Have you looked at whether you can design a house where you have the drive? <coughs> You park in the back. Obviously, you can't exit via the alley, but you could turn around. Oh, or, but, but park, or back no, out. It, it goes through like the public alley. They cannot park there. It's very narrow, narrow alley. And Mr. Pepper, on behalf of staff, in case it helps, this is a 25 foot wide lot. The minimum drive aisle under the zoning code is 12 feet. So to subtract the requisite 12 from that 25 would leave a 13 foot area to meet setback requirements on the other side, which would probably be a three-foot build-to zone for this substandard lot, and thus a 10-foot wide house. Yeah, okay. That's Where's Christine? So the answer is that's not, okay, okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, sir, the new uh, zoning code is like uh, three set uh, <coughs> side, side, uh, side back set. So, and can you put the picture of the plat up of the neighboring lots just so... Uh, so you're, every, everybody up, up the street does have alley access, yes, right? Sir, you, yeah. you don't. Because Only the, the three uh, last lots, they have. Is that, the, these, I assume these lots were at one time somewhat uniform. Was there a right of way? Is that what? Interstate. That's interstate. the interstate, okay. It's so the interstate event is Exactly. Worth. Okay, yeah, gotcha. And if, if you didn't get the variance, I would, is the only option just for the homeowner to park on the street wherever they find a spot? They won't issue the permit. There is, without parking, they won't issue the permit. So I typically <laughs> agree with Mr. Pepper. I don't like if, it's, if you're in our 6A district putting the parking in the front, um, but due to the interstate and the narrowness of the lot and the lack of an alley being all the way built to this lot, it, I think there might be a case that this is unique enough to justify the variance. Was there any, any other questions for the applicant? And I don't know if this is in our purview, and so Mr. Michaels told me if it's not, but is it possible if we granted the variance that we required him to dedicate, like, the right away for the alley in the event that an alley is built in the future by Metro. <laughs> you, of course, are allowed by law to attach conditions to any approvals on variances. That's stated plainly in Title 17.40. Um, so you're going to go back and double check and make sure that the alley is dedicated. As, as per my custom, Mr. Lawless, of course. <laughs> um, the, uh, worthy of note here. It'd be a heck of a bend in that yeah, existing alley yeah, to get there it because the T dot right of way is one that, as you might imagine, the state of Tennessee guards very zealously uh, with regard to proximity to the interstate. Um, the I guess it would be southwest side of that alley shows you just how harsh those drawing of lines have been historically. Uh, our board members, most of whom have been in Nashville for a very long time, are familiar with this area, familiar with the unfortunate history of interstate placement here in the city of Nashville and in most major cities across the southeast in particular, in terms of which neighborhoods were uh, identified for placement of interstates. This is a lot that has been adversely affected in the same manner, not as harshly as those to the southwest of the alley, but nevertheless adversely affected. Presence of this alley makes the project much more doable. Um, the tough request in front of you could potentially be benefited by the idea that you have in terms of placing that requirement for that dedication of easement in the event of an eventual dedication of an alteration of that alley. Um, I may still leave the requisite building envelope to get a house in there. Okay. Thank you. That was very helpful. So I'd be willing to move to a... Well, we haven't. We just haven't closed the public hearing. Oh, gosh. Okay. I thought we were in discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any other questions? Did you have anything else to add? Oh, sir, thank Any you. other questions for the applicant? All right, I'll close public hearing. <laughs> Mr. Pepper. <laughs> I, I would move that we, have, we approve it uh, with the uh, stipulation that if the uh, applicant has the opportunity to obtain any of the property that would allow the dedication of a, a right away in the alley, is that what we, what, Ms. Davis, you were looking at? That, that he be required to dedicate a right of way for the alley to continue should he if it's allowed yeah if it's allowed or if he obtains the property yeah. 
My main concern is you're going to have this big chunk of concrete out front they're going to park the cars on. Don't have any other choice, obviously. And this may be the only time you hear me talk about trees. And I like trees, and there needs to be something because you're going to... Emily, can you go to the picture pretty please? Uh, no, the that one. Okay. I mean... It's a little tree. I, mean, I don't know whether that, I, you're going to have a car parked there where that tree is now, and there's going to be some room that at least you get some tree or two or three. Would you at least require the arborist to approve some type of trees as long as they're not hackberries? <laughs> uh, sure. So would you be looking for an amendment that the, there be a design plan that allows for at some point in that, in that, when he's building it, after he gets it built, that he puts some tree, some type of that type of. Yeah, we could do that. Could plant some. All right. Trees. I don't. I mean, I. That's that's what I would like to do. I mean, I'm. Well, presumably there'll be some space between where the neighbor's concrete begins and then the driveway that and parking pad he puts in. Or uh, we could we could uh, amend it to require that there be enough space have the to, to, to approve have a, the arborist to prove a tree. I'm looking at Mr. Michael. Here. That is a stipulation, I believe, that you could put down. Our urban forester has a list of approved tree species that are appropriate for planting yeah, in projects like these. I can see the hackberry. So yeah. we're already sneezing in anticipation of them, Mr. Lawless. All right. So is that your motion and motion. with an amendment that that friendly amendment? Both that, amendments, right? That, all right. So there's a motion to approve the variance. Um, to allow parking in the front uh, negotiated with Public Works and to uh, provide uh, trees um, as negotiated with the urban forester. And for the record, the applicant did say that he would be willing to do that, so it would, right. it's not really in that hard of an imposition. And, and the expectation of the parking is uh, similar to the one next door, provided Public Works agrees. There's a motion, there's a second. Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. Any opposed? Uh, that passes. Good luck. Next case, 2020-030, involving property at 523 Chesterfield Avenue. This is a request for a variance from front setback requirements to construct, to construct a detached accessory dwelling unit. Before you is a zoning map showing the zoning of the property as RM20. Aerial photography giving you a sense of the surrounding area. This is the site plan submitted by the applicant, and finally the photograph showing you the current conditions of the property. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 30? Seeing none, you'll have five minutes to make your presentation. Please be sure to identify yourself by name and address. Okay, I'm Bob Cummings. Uh, this is my wife, Beth. Uh, we live at 523 Chesterfield Avenue. <clears throat> We've been living there for 32 years. Uh, we are wanting to uh, get a setback variance uh, because uh, 440 is right behind us, Interstate 440. Uh, we don't have any neighbors behind us or on the facing the street on the right side of us. Uh, we only have neighbors on one side. We don't have any neighbors across the street either. Uh, you, I guess you can see that from the map. We have no neighbors except for the condo development next door. So we're wanting to build a small building here, um, a guest house, and uh, all we're asking for, and, and we can't build it anywhere, we, we, I don't know if you got a copy of the survey, but we have a survey here. Uh, the only, that's the only place we can build it, and all we're asking for is a setback variance for, to be the same as the condo development next to us. So th that's a nice, uh, I'm glad that we have this view because on when I just get your survey, I, I think it, 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 it just, I'll just be flat out with, uh, with you. When I just look at your survey, I think, boy, this is a big ask. <laughs> it's why? Because you're, you know, 12 feet is, uh, <laughs> and, and, and you clearly have an, uh, an, a strange shaped lot, um, but the survey itself doesn't provide the context that the, uh, the previous slide could, Emily, can we go back to just the, the site where, uh, the one that has the con, that one, so you're asking, you're saying that that condo development, uh, 
because of its orientation, sits 12 feet off Chesterfield, and that's what you're proposing We're asking for the same to do thing. on your odd-shaped lot. And what's the purpose? The purpose of your guest house is, I mean, you don't, how did the uh, needs arise, and what? Uh, well, we possibly do it as a rental. Okay. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, like I said, we've been there for 32 years. All we're asking for is the same setback as the people next door to us. We don't have any neighbors other than them. And then, we're, um, as you come down, the, is, is there, if you're if you're looking at your house to the left, what, what where's the nearest home or nearest street? Does that just dead end? There's that nothing. Would be, that would be across 440. Oh, I see. So y'all are y'all are at the bridge on Chesterfield right before it goes over. Right. Okay. Right. And so so there is not so it's either your land or state land that's kind of Correct. right there. And okay. the Van Vanderbilt property is across the street. It's the Alexander Heard Library across the street. Oh, the like Vanderbilt storage where they store uh, the books to archives. All right. uh -huh. We're the last house before we go over the interstate. Okay. Are there any, any questions for the applicant? Did you all have anything else to add? Not unless you have any questions. Any questions? All right, uh, no questions. So if you don't have anything else, nothing else to add? I don't think so. All right, you don't have to add anything. I just want to make sure everybody <laughs> has all the chances they, they, they need well, to say no. Well, we were assuming that, but maybe we shouldn't assume, that because the developers next door built the townhomes and the variance was given that, you know, it would make sense <coughs> that you would consider giving us the same variance okay. that they were able to get. Okay, great. And I, yeah, and I don't know how they did that, I, you know, but... Uh, Certainly, I, I understand your case, mm -hmm. and, and I don't. They may be an SP. They may have had another. You know, I don't know <laughs> when they were built, right. or how they came about. But uh, but but your your point uh, in terms of being at a line where your neighbor is, I, right. I, I totally well, understand. Well, they built those uh, in the last two or three years. <coughs> okay, so it's recent. Yes. Okay. Very recent. Mm -hmm. All right. So good. I will close the public hearing, and um, and we can have discussion. Well, and I, I mean, I stated earlier I, when I just saw their survey, I thought, boy, you know, that's it is an odd shaped lot, but that's a, 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 a really close. But I think the context on the screen uh, really <coughs> provides a, at, le at least a path for a, an argument that, uh, you know, the, the hardship, I think, is the lot. Um, Well, you got, if you're looking at their survey, you've got that little dotted line as the setback line. And so they they might be able to pull it back, a, you know. Yeah. That's all I'm asking. Make it, I mean, it's, you know. Well, there's a sewer line there, too. Point. But I don't, I, I don't. Yeah, I'm not, I mean, I'm not adamant yay or nay. I'm just, <coughs> there I mean, I guess, for setbacks. That's still the reason. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess I'm, I mean, I, I would be comfortable saying, you know, minimum 12 foot setback. If they can push it back further, that's, that's fine. I certainly would recommend it. But it, if they don't, then I don't, I mean, again, whether it's 12 or 13 at that point, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure that matters, but work me through it, Ross. Well, I, it's a very, it's a very unique piece of property, and I agree with Mr. Taylor about the. If you look at it in the context of there's nobody, there's no neighbor. The four forties right next to them. Vanderbilt's across the street. Then on the other side, you have these. Uh, apartments or condominiums that have the same there's the overview is what they're requesting so I, mean, I, I think it's a very unique situation and a very yeah. unique piece of property and I don't, I don't think what they're doing is going to detract yeah. from well the as cemetery you, yeah. in the neighborhood and so as you round the corner too on to Blair I think that that whole condominium or that whole development that's kind of at the top of that picture is one of those 
pedestrian friendly townhomes pretty much on the street uh, type of development. So it, it doesn't seem to be an outlier in that immediate area. And you know, that was part of their argument. But it, you know, again, it, it, if I had just gotten their survey and it had been in a neighborhood where it, that was the closest thing to the street, I, would, I wouldn't have seen, uh, I might have seen the hardship, but I probably wouldn't have voted for it. But because it is exactly where it is and the logic is such and the lot's odd shape, I, I, I'm inclined to not going to be used that all that part because of the unique shape of the lot that part of the lot's not going to be usable if you don't if we don't allow the the variance <coughs> yeah you've got the back set back and the easements in the back so so then making a motion uh, i'll move to approve the uh, to grant the appeal to build a guest house with, yes, with that 12 foot all right or like, yeah, it, their appeal is for a day due. So, is there a second? Second. I have a motion. I have a second. Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. Any opposed? That motion passes. Good luck. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Next case, two thousand twenty zero three one, involving property at eight forty one Clematis Drive. Is the applicant here? Before you is a zoning map showing the zoning of the property is RS15. This is a request to construct an addition to a single family residence. This is aerial photography giving you a sense of the surrounding area. Site plan submitted by the applicant. And finally, the current conditions of the property. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 31? Seeing none, you'll have five minutes to make your desired presentation. Please be sure to identify yourself by name and address. Uh, hello, thank you for your time this afternoon. My name is Patrick Terry, and I live at 6521 Jocelyn Hollow Road. And uh, this is my brother Rob. We I live at 6525 Jocelyn Hollow Road. <coughs> we just want to put an addition on the front of this house. It's um, it's um, it it needed attention when we bought it. And I think the neighbors are glad that somebody's finally going to clean it up. And do you, can you tell us the one thing, you know, I, I, I had trouble figuring out when I was reviewing this is just what the setback is and how that something might help you. Right that now. would be great because I didn't understand it. Color. Yeah, I didn't understand it from the, uh, the drawing that's on the screen right now, which is what we have in our packet. I didn't understand what the setback was and what you were asking for. So if you know that, that would be really helpful. We originally went down to, or I did, I went down to Codes and talked to a zoning examiner or whatever, and he told me it was 30 feet. We got with our architect, our, our, our builder went down there to pull the permit, and, he, and then they told us that the setback was different than we thought. Okay. And so you're asking, it's, it sounds like that the setback is 90 feet. 90 feet, and one side, one one point of the garage will be 70, and the other will be 64. Is that right? Correct. Yes, correct. Correct. Right here, uh, 68 from that corner to, and then it it looks like that your property line is also off the street. Uh, so I mean, it, it it says 68, and then the 64 goes to that hard dot, uh, the the big thick black line, and it looks like there's. I, I guess that's some right away or some, yeah. I yeah, guess but it's, it looks like that there's still another 10 or 15 feet between your property line and the road. So, so it. It's a big. It's a big lot, and there's not much. And then what need. you have? There's currently an asphalt drive that goes to the back of the property. What are you going to do with the existing asphalt drive? Because you're adding another driveway. You're gonna we're going to add another driveway, but we're going to get rid of that back part of that asphalt driveway to add to our backyard. Okay, so are you going to keep the keep part of the drive, or are you just going to? I, I think right now we're going to keep it to let visitors park right there and come up the front sidewalk and to the front door on okay. that side. Yeah, but, but, they, but you'll remove the part in the back, which I guess is currently a parking place where people park. Correct. That's where okay. the garage is right now. And, and the hardship, I think you had stated maybe that where the current asphalt drive is, it, it's, is it steep? Is there, I know there's a retaining wall or something back there. 
There's a yeah. There's a. Why does the why does the proposed addition need to be where it is instead of in the back? We we we're um, when we met with our architect, this was the the best solution we could come up with as far as making the house flow flow properly to add some square footage, and 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 we're we're on a corner lot, so we're just crammed back in that corner there, and 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 we want to have some backyard for. So you wouldn't have any set. So there it. Well, if you built a garage back there, it would it would have to have a setback variance request too. I, I, I mean, you'd be too close. It seems like it, you'd be too close to the side by appearances. And is that a retaining wall in the back? That's the, yes, that's a retaining wall. Okay, so you do have uh, hill. It, issues. It's it's not it's it there is a there is a little bit of slope. It's not real bad, but it's it's probably only okay two or three feet tall. It's not real steep. Okay. Any any questions? Is there anything else that you'd like to add? I don't think any of the neighbors have any problem with it. They're they're glad to see us do something with it. Okay. Shanti, did you? So you're so you're actually building away from the closest neighbors because closest neighbors are behind you, and so you're building in the front. That's correct. Are there any other questions? Um, so I guess I'm looking through this and it looks like you guys have done a lot of legwork. I'm trying to find your hardship. Like what about this particular property and the addition that you're proposing? What's unique about this property that presents a hardship to the addition that you're proposing? And then have you considered alternative designs? I heard something about the flow of the house, but if you could just talk a little bit more about that. Well, there's, there's really not a good place to put an addition on the house in the back uh, if you wanted any backyard at all. Um, and of course, it really wouldn't look like much of anything. I mean, when you do an addition, you want it to look like part of the house, like it was supposed to be built that way. So um, we feel that, and our architect, uh, she's a renowned Nashville architect, she seems to think this would be a good good fit for the piece of property. Um, I, I feel like that since we're on the corner that we're just kind of, if you look at our lot, we, I mean, you know, well, well over half of it, we can't do anything on. I mean, we're just crammed back in that corner with that building set back. And, and maybe, I don't know if this setbacks, it, it, it's on, it's on the Shiloh side, but I don't know if it's more suited towards the other houses running up and down Shiloh than us. Maybe, I don't know, but I just, I just feel like, um, and we, we, we went over with the architect, you know, trying to figure out a way to, you know, make a nice house and so people have a nice floor plan and add a little bit of square footage. And this is kind of what we came up with. So the red, the red is the setback line. That's the 90, right? And so you've got your proposed addition. So it's about three fourths of the proposed addition that goes into the setback area. Yeah, it's that corner. It says 26 feet from the corner all the way to the setback. That's the that's the part that that shaded area there. That would be. Any other questions? Now he's going to. He, he testified that he's he's going to add a new driveway on one side, and he's going to keep a portion of the existing driveway as a guest parking. It's on the uh, other side, but they both are on kind of the extreme far sides of of the lot. Are they going to add some extra tree questions to him? Twice. Where are you putting the new drive drive in, gentlemen? What what trees are over there? Because it looks like you've got a lot of a lot of trees on that side of the lot. We can. Um, there's no 
There's no tree where the driveway well, that we're There won't be a tree cut down to put that driveway in. Any other questions? Did you all have anything else to add? All right, we'll close the public hearing. You know, the, the, the only thing, I guess I'll look at it, uh, you know, if we talked about alternative designs and if you take this block and, and really plop it any other place in, in the back of the house, uh, because it has a garage, if you put it on the, you know, not just directly behind the house, because I'm not sure how you get up and over, but if you put it on the left side of the house where the current driveway is, they're gonna have to ask for a variance, um, a side variance, because it's not possible to do that without uh, asking for, uh, unless the side variance is, you know, like five feet, but I don't think it is. Um, I think they're gonna have to ask for a variance regardless if they build a garage. And I don't have as much issue with this one because a, the property line is still 15 to 20 feet from the street. And the offense is 15 or 20 feet. So I, th I think it's not gonna really have an impact on the street and it's a corner lot with a, a diagonal facing home. And what we normally get with these diagonal facing home corner lot requests is I wanna come in and build two houses and I need a, a setback variance or something because I can't put two houses on a house that, uh, on a lot that was a, that was designed for a, you know, a diagonal facing corner lot. And I think they're enhancing that. So I'm mainly because of the corner lot, the placement of the house and the fact that their property line, uh, between their property line and the street has by appearances almost enough land to make up for that difference in setback requirement, I'm comfortable with the variance. A 90 foot setback is a lot. I mean, that's, yeah. that, they're, they're starting, if you look at this lot and think about what you can do with a 90 foot setback it's um well and, and they're they get it see many 90 foot yeah. setbacks i don't you don't it's all in, in, in big in, in lots like this where you have big lot i mean in neighborhoods where you got big you know big yards but the corner lot you're kind of you know, again i don't know and there's you know they're they're presenting it as both if as if both streets are are the front and that may be what it's considered but that's kind of part of it too, is it, you know, being the corner lot, you know, it'd be interesting to measure from that corner point to the garage, <laughs> you know, from that, that very corner point to the new garage and see what that is, because I bet it's, it's, it's a longer point and it's gonna be closer to, you know, 90 feet from the street as designed, but it's, it's, you know, the closest point to the closest street and that's where you get the 64 and 68. So. So is the 90 feet from? It's 90 feet from the property. It's, no, it's shallow. Both is that? It's, well, I don't know, but it's it's from the property line and not the street. And, right. and part of what I'm saying is that there's a huge space according to their drawing between the property line and the street. I mean, you're getting another 20 feet <coughs> from property line to street. So effectively, they're 84 and 88. You know, if it's 20 feet, and if it's if it you know, again, I don't. On the 68 side, it looks longer than on the side where they're asking for you know 64. But even that looks to be 10 or 15 feet. So you're talking about you know it's 80 instead of 90, and it's still from the street. Um, and I know that's not. To me, that's a measure of impact. You know, I mean, if you if you've got that much space. It effectively isn't, you know, and in, in effectively a 90 foot or closer to a 90 foot. It minimizes the offense, so to speak. Were there any other thoughts or comments? Just a tree, and they. Looks like they had a lot of trees on there. Yeah, I mean, they got more trees than most. Well, I just to single. It's a single family, which is a whole lot. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, without the absence of other other comments, I'll move that we approve the variance based on the hardship that it's a corner lot. Uh, there's an effective, uh, the property line is sets off the street. 
which uh, minimizes the impact of the variance and uh, you know, be, being the corner lot diagonal facing makes it uh, a unique situation that warrants a variance. That's a motion, I'll second. That was a motion. It may, unless I don't, it, just, just move it along. No matter, you, you vote, vote, vote your, vote, vote your, vote your, uh, your will, but, but just to, to try to keep us, uh, so keep tell, us going. Tell the hardship again, when you articulated that. Well, the hardship is that it, because it's a, it's a, a, a corner lot, and it's a diagonal facing home. It faces basically the point of that corner, uh, but the measurement isn't from the point of the corner. The measurement's from the street, so that impacts a little bit of its distance. And it sits so far back. Uh, the location choice is certainly a choice of the owner, but uh, I also believe that if they had chosen to put it on the side where the existing driveway is, it would be closer to their neighbor's home and they would still be required to ask for a variance. So I think that it's, uh, you know, it, it, to me it meets the location test of is, there, is, there, is this the best alternative for it? And uh, maybe I already said that uh, the property line being offset from the actual road makes the effective, the, the impact less than the true length of the variance. I mean, they're asking for a, from 90 to 64, but effectively, it, uh, if you were a, a lay person thinking you were supposed to be 90 feet from the street, they're gonna be much closer than 64 feet, or much further from six, than 64 feet from the street <coughs> because of that difference uh, in the property line. And those, that was my case. That, is that fair? <laughs> yeah, that's fair to me. All right. I'm, I'm, I'm following you. It's... Does anybody have any other calls, questions, or need additional information to make up their mind one way or the other? All right, so we will, the uh, question's been called. Uh, all in favor of the variance and uh, as presented, uh, say aye and raise your hand. All those opposed, say aye and raise your hand. Uh, that motion passes. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Next case for the board to consider is case 2020-037 involving property at 3928, 3930, and 3932 Gallatin Pike. This is a request for variances from the parking and build to zone requirements to construct an office building. Before you is the zoning map showing the zoning of the property as MULA. Aerial photography giving you a sense of the property and surrounding areas. This is the site plan submitted by the applicant. And finally, the uh, photograph showing you the current conditions of the property. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 37? Seeing none, you can come forward and make your presentation. Please be sure to identify yourself by name and address. You have five minutes. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Chair, if I, could, if I may kindly make a request, uh, we actually just met a adjacent property owner who's here today at the commission in support. Um, what, what would be appropriate to have, grant him the opportunity to speak uh, after our presentation? It'll come out? Okay. Yeah, 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 you can, anybody that you wanna speak in, in it's, just, it's just part of your time. Great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Scott Morton with Smith G Studio. I work for, uh, we are the architect and design consultant uh, working with the property owner. Introduce yourself. Nathan Weinberg. I live at 3944 Moss Rose Drive. So we're here today to request uh, two different variances for this site. Um, the, the purpose of this request is to propose to develop um, primarily within the current zoning, a four-story building within the MULA zoning district. We have two requests for your consideration today. Um, one is to reduce the overall required parking for the uh, zoning code for office development, uh, which we've conducted a parking study that will demonstrate our request. And request number two is for a slight reduction in the upper floor building step back. Um, so this is very similar to the case that you heard earlier today uh, that required a three-story building within the setback and then a fourth floor with a 
a 15 foot step back. So it's uh, just for your reference. Um, so we're requesting for a slight reduction and I'll go through that in greater detail. Um, as part of our request, we did conduct a community meeting with the Inglewood Neighborhood Association. It was well attended. Uh, the council person was in attendance as well. Uh, the outcome of the meeting, the concerns from the community uh, were about traffic in the area. Uh, there was very much general support for our development. Uh, the reduction in parking was something that they supported, obviously means less cars uh, on their neighborhood streets. Uh, and we also, you should have received in your packet a letter of support from the uh, council member as well. How does that follow? Sorry? I, I don't, I, I think that, I don't understand that argument. Less parking means less cars on their street. Less car, less parking. Are you saying, are you saying, I mean, if, if we, are you, you're saying that 98, you're required to have 98 spaces, you're saying you only need 72, or you're providing 72 is what you say you need. But you're saying that the building will never need 98. I, I guess I don't, I don't follow. It seems like if you are required to have 98, meaning that the building needed 98 and you only had 72, well, where did the other 26 go? It seems like it'd go to their street. So I guess that's what I didn't follow. So help me understand just what you're talking about. <laughs> I'm just about. saying if, the, if we were required to have 98 spaces and we had surplus that was used from other, you know, adjacent properties, we would have more cars parked there that would use their street. That was the... The, the point, I guess, of that okay. is there's, there's just more cars on the street. You're saying he'll never need 98 spaces with the building you're building. That's correct. Yes. Sir. Okay. That's sure. all right. Um, Do a parking study. Yes, sir. I'm, I will get okay, into to the sorry, details we're, of that. Yes, we're sir. jumping the gun. I, I apologize. That's for okay. That. We've all no. been here a long time. Good, and I'm sorry all good about. questions. Um, so the proposed use for the property is office, condos. Um, our request for parking reduction is a request of 25% reduction to the required parking for general office land use within the zoning code. Office condos are a unique office subset that specifically targets small business owners and startups within the community. They're also highly uh, amenitized and have minimal staff. Uh, our, we have a parking study that demonstrates that the current market demand for office condo parking is much lower than the minimum requirements required by the zoning code. Um, furthermore, the proposed development, you know, enhances the existing character of Gallatin Pike and meets the policy goals. Um, the proposed building is really prioritized to front onto Gallatin Pike and to screen parking internal to the development to promote a more active and pedestrian friendly streetscape. Um, the parking study's 25% reduction in overall parking is recommended based on the research of local comps and demonstrates that uses of a similar nature in the community have significantly lower demand than in the marketplace today than what is required by the zoning code. Um, furthermore, this property is considered potentially for a future expansion of the urban zoning overlay. Um, the reason this is significant is that if it were to be considered, um, what we have promoted, provided in parking would be in, in excess of parking required for the UZO standards. There's a significant bonus for properties in urban zoning overlay. Um, the parking we provided it would, would uh, equate to over 175% increase above the uh, basic UZO parking requirement for office. Um, now that's not in place, but I think you know that's relevant <coughs> context and for the parking. And so, currently, based on the 25% reduction, just so everyone understands, is we are required to have 96 spaces based on our square footage. Uh, we are requesting for a 25% reduction to 72 spaces provided for the property. <laughs> the second request relates to uh, the building step back. Um, we have a variation that we want to propose to you for consideration. The requirement is that the building height is limited to three stories within 45 feet uh, within the build to zone. If you, you can go up to a fourth floor as long as you provide a 15 foot horizontal building step back from the front facade. Uh, that fourth floor can extend to a height of 60 feet uh, in total height. Um, our request is to eliminate that 15 foot step back on the fourth floor for a small portion of the entire building for 60 linear frontage at the very corner along both street frontages. Uh, also, and that is to provide allow flexibility for architectural fenestration and uh, the facade at that corner component. The request is also to encroach up to 
12 feet within that step back for a, an architectural canopy. And this is a component of the design you can see within the elevation that's providing cover for a rooftop terrace. And it's just a, a simple horizontal uh, canopy that would extend slightly within that step back. The subject property, um, from a hardship perspective, is irregular in shape and it's narrow in depth. Uh, a combination of the following factors further constrains the site and our development potential. Uh, currently, there's overhead power lines on Gallatin Pike and our OSHA requirements require safe distance between the building and the power lines um, in 10 feet clearance for the power lines plus additional five foot for scaffolding, 15 feet. Uh, secondly, there's an extensive right-of-way dedication of eight and a half feet to uh, promote future transit expansion along the corridor. Thirdly, uh, with the zoning of MULA, we are required to provide a 20-foot transitional landscape buffer along the rear of the property. In addition to that, we've extended that buffer to wider to promote some of the stormwater uh, requirements by Metro uh, at the lower portion of the site. And lastly, it, it's a corner parcel and per zoning co code that the front facade has to extend across 45% of the whole frontage along both streets. Um, due to this, we have really limited our parking areas to the rear in a very defined location due to these constraints. Um, what's remaining is a very shallow building depth of 45 feet that's available for the built structure. And the goal is to use that smaller office space to to promote a more affordable price point to an underserved office market in the area. Um, once we do a 15 foot step back on that fourth floor, it limits that upper floor to a 25 feet building depth, which is, it really constricts the ability of uh, developing an efficient floor plan for office use on that fourth floor. Um, so to promote greater flexibility along that corner and for that fourth floor amenity, we are proposing to allow for some additional depth at the corner specifically, um, and we're doing this with, with, while also making some concessions to our allowable height. Um, and this is relevant to the context of the neighborhood. Um, we're trying to localize all of our four-story requests along Gallatin Pike. Um, while today it would be uh, permitted to have four stories further south towards the neighborhood on Sunnymead, um, we think it's more appropriate to step down in height and scale um, as you step down to the community. So the height of the building will step down as it goes towards Sunnymead to uh, 33 feet in height. I'm sorry, 43 feet in height. I said that backwards. Um, and three stories along Sunnymead. Um, the reduction of the fourth floor, it, it really provides greater design flexibility to architect articulate the scale, the massing, and really create an interesting architectural corner feature. Um, and lastly, I will say that Gallatin Pike is a major arterial boulevard that links East Nashville to downtown, served by active transit. Uh, the proposed development meets the policy intent uh, of specifically, specifically focusing higher density development along the major corridors and transit lines. Um, I thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions, and I would love to give the opportunity of the adjacent landowner to say a few words if, 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 if he time permits. Uh, your time is long up. I would, it's, an important, it's an important project, so I, I wanted to hear things. So let me ask uh, if anybody objects to a minute for him to, all right, so Thanks. have a minute, and then uh, we'll ask, ha have any questions. Hello, uh, my name is Michael O'Keefe. I live at 1102 Sunnymead Drive, and I'm the property just to the southeast um, on Sunnymead. So just behind the kind of 30-foot buffer there. Okay. And in general, I'm just supportive of the commercial property in general. Uh, when we moved in, it was, uh, it was previously a church, and that church burned. Uh, so we always knew a property was going to be put in on this property. And after seeing the plans and the aesthetics, uh, we think it's going to be a positive influence for the neighborhood, um, as well as provide an, you know, an anchor ship uh, for that corner um, and just provide more kind of businesses to grow and be a positive for the neighborhood in general. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks. I appreciate it. Let me, I'm sorry, do you? I just had a question for that. <laughs> yeah, that, no, perfect. Um, how many units are going to be in this building? Uh, so the office condos, it's all, all office. Uh, there's no residential. Um, how many condos do we end up having? I think it's, it's like 30-ish. Yeah. They, they range from about 600 square feet up to about 1,250 square feet. 
and that's a flexible <coughs> floor plan range based on the building. I'm sorry. That's a flexible floor plan range based on the businesses that decide to make this their home. So we wanted to have something that was flexible for them. I appreciate the traffic study, and I'm looking at just for everybody else's reference. It looks like on page 361 of our packet, uh, and you have five uh, as sample or five examples uh, of comparable properties. And they range from, I guess, 2.05 to 2.88 uh, peak demand spaces per thousand square feet. And so if there's that much variance in it, I thought, okay, well, what's what's your sure. deviation there? And then, so, but it looks to me like, if I, if I thought, well, let's take out the high and the low, and that would require, you, you're, at, you're providing 72 spaces. If you take out the high and the low, uh, the average would provide 74. But then I thought, well, okay, well, let's look at the at the one, the Armory Oaks, though, that's the one that required the most uh, space, and it's the one that uh, is closest to your size. Uh, the others are much larger. And so it was <laughs> 2.88, and I think that, you know, it looks like 80 spaces. So you're, you're close, even on the high end of the average, to your 72. So I, I, I always want to know if... So it, it seems like that a reduction based on this study is something to, for us to consider. Um, but what's the contingency plan if it's closer to Armory Hills Oaks and you need 80 and you only have 72? Where do people go and, and how do you accommodate uh, if you're wrong in your right. assumptions? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think, you know, based on the office condo nature, it is it's very much, a, it's a difficult thing to find comps for. And in fact, the traffic right. engineer had a challenge to try to find similar product and they're not all exactly apples to apples as far as the, the use. But, um, you know, in the modern office place, there is really a lot more square footage dedicated to each employee now uh, than before in this office condo type of market, given the, the high level of amenities. And so, uh, based on our experience in office condos, um, we feel like the 72 spaces provided is uh, more than excessive for the parking needs that we'll have for the property. And so the nature of the development um, really limits it to office, you know, in the future as well. Um, in the event, you know, just want to think, you know, any kind of scenario, in the event there's a, a future tenant that requires a significant parking demand for whatever reason, um, there would be opportunities in the area to secure within the zoning code requirements um, off-site parking arrangements with the adjacent church across the street, for example, uh, would be an option to consider for future parking needs, uh, <laughs> as well as other adjacent uh, commercial properties along the corridor within the 500-foot requirement. So that would be the uh, worst case scenario. And, and we've started those conversations already, just so you know. We, we anticipated this being something that we needed to get in front of. We've spoken to the churches that are adjacent. Those conversations are ongoing and positive. It's a it's a large sort of hierarchy of decision making in those churches. So I don't have a yay or nay to give so you. So your your plan B is if we denied the parking variance, you'd have to cover it somehow, and you've already talked to the churches about the possibility. That conversation, okay. but I don't want to rely on a maybe, and so that's sort right. of why we're here. Sure. So what the looking at this um, uh, picture up here. It looks like there's some residential behind. Is that correct? And yeah. Is, that, is it, do those any of those or the, is there any on-street parking available there? Sunny Mead is a pretty narrow street as it is now. Neighbors are allowed to and do often park along Sunny Mead, um, but Sunny Mead is running to the okay. I see it. Yeah. So S Sunny Mead would be at the top of your screen. Gallatin Pike is the larger right artery that runs north and south there. So is there, there's, are you saying there's no on-street parking allowed on Sunny Mead or that they do park? It's allowed there. It's not formal on-street parking. It's just uh, permitted. You know, it's not signed as no parking. Right. And then the same thing with Norvell, I guess that's probably, it's allowed to. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think that the, the concern I have is with parking, to me, it's like comparing apples and oranges because you could get a business in there that has 12,000 square feet and, and underutilized parking, but you just don't know. You might get a business in there that, for whatever reason, puts lots of people in small cubicles and you have more parking. And so I don't, my concern is, all, my, my concern here would be that, because what's going to happen is if you don't have enough, they're going to spill over on the Sunny Mean and Norvell, and then you're going to have 
re neighbors that all of a sudden have a parking issue. And I guess that's what yeah. Chairman Taylor is getting at is that's my concern. I think I think your parking study you've done everything you can do with it, but I, again, I think it's like apples and oranges. <laughs> I really do. I mean, it's if I could address that for just a second. So, you know, in our community meeting, that was the comment that came up. What happens? And actually, the comment was less about parking on the street. It was more about traffic. Where does traffic go? Um, the fact of the matter is that these units are going to be priced in a way that a larger office tenant, somebody who would come in and buy these to have their employees there, isn't looking at this. It's, it's too expensive for them because they could go out and build. We're identifying sort of small startups and incubated businesses that are one, two, and three employee style businesses. That's who can afford and is buying these rather than paying exorbitant per square foot rents sort of down on the Main Street corridor of East Nashville. So I, I appreciate that, but I also think that just as somebody who has parked in offices that had parking challenges and seen side streets like this, the side streets weren't a real option. And I think that anybody who would be working in this building or visiting this building would see that street the same way. It doesn't look like it's an appropriate place to park. And I think just to add to that, the floor plan and architecturally, um, this is very much a boutique office uh, plan. It's a 45 feet depth. Um, just to give it just context, the standard office uh, footprint is 145 feet in depth. So we're, we're extremely narrow, shallow type of building. We're gonna have a corridor along the back. It creates very small, uh, limited boutique workspaces, uh, as Nathan said, for one to two, or you know, one to five small group uh, employee types and tenant spaces. And so it doesn't have quite the range of flexibility you would see in a conventional office environment with a larger foot floor plate. Um, and so in a large degree, the, the footprint does constrict our abilities for attracting those tenants as I, well. I also think, you know, I'm a resident of this neighborhood. And so one of the challenges that we've had since I've lived over here and long before this was encouraging the growth of business along Gallatin Pike. And you can see that anybody who's driven up and down Gallatin Pike in the last 20 years knows what Gallatin Pike looks like. It's a sort of a sea of check cashing stores and, and whatnot, and we're trying to change that. And if you go back to the zoning, you can sort of see that there were attempts, and I think good, good hearted ones, to change the zoning along Gallatin Pike to encourage the in, uh, sort of installation of more beneficial businesses to this neighborhood. Um, but what didn't keep up with this were the parking requirements. The parking requirements of Metro didn't think long and hard about what's happened along here. And so we've lost the opportunity for an awful lot of businesses to come in here. Publix is a great example of something that took a really long time to finally show up here. And it really finally happened after, I believe, a meeting here. Um, and so I, this building's important. It's the first one of its kind along Gallatin Pike in this section. Um, and allowing small businesses to incubate in East Nashville, and especially in this little section of East Nashville, is gonna be a massive economic motivator for the Inglewood piece of East Nashville. And we're seeing parking allowances made up in Madison. We're seeing them to the south of this site on Gallatin Pike, but we're not seeing them right here. And I, I hate to use the word fair, <laughs> but it seems to me that if you're using an arterial street like Gallatin Pike as an example, then the same sort of um, application should be made to the entirety of that road. And I would just add one last note, please. If the, I um, have a question. I'm going to interrupt you guys because yeah. I've been sitting back and waiting, and I've waited as long as I'm going to. Um, what's the projected user? Office. Office. And it, what type of office? Boutique I mean, office. I'm looking up here right now, and I see anatomic arts. That's a tattoo parlor, right? Uh-huh. Okay. And then I see you've got next door to the projected area a hair salon of some type. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> So, so, so far we know what we're talking about. Now, you're going to have at least 30 units. You're going to have some clue 
what you're marketing to. I think that there are attorneys. I think there are architects. I think that there are CPAs. I think there are land surveyors. I, the reason that you see businesses like many of those businesses have been there for decades, by the way, and they are welcomed members of the community, and they do great things for the community there. And so these are users that are buying these. These are ownership stakes. They're not lease stakes in the building. You hope. You don't no, know. No, I know. I'm selling them. Yeah, I know you're selling them, but you don't know if it's it's you buy it for someone else to use. And I think I have a little bit of knowledge of what lawyers do. You try to cram as much as you can into a short amount of space. That's fine. I've got the information I need. Well, Thank you. I wanted to comment, too, that um, Council Member Emily Benedict mentioned uh, Council Member Van Reese, and she were working to help do just what you said, and that's improve the quality yeah. of what comes I've had extensive conversations with both of them. Hard Who is your council member? It's Who? Emily Benedict. Is that Emily, is, and did, have we heard from Council yeah, Lady Benedict? There's a she put a there. letter in yeah. your packet and in support of this? And she says she and Nancy Van Rees are working to put a UDO there, similar to what you know oh. we've seen trying to happen over on Nolensville Pike, is upgrade what is there. And it's long overdue that, um, what is the maker's <laughs> place that Matt Koenigson was so involved in in East Nashville? That's the kind of thing that, that I see happening over there. A lot of very um, and entrepreneurial types will show up what we want. to make something there. Yeah. And, and they're trying, and the council lady, she is trying to extend the, the urban zoning overlay. And so for just a great example of the disparity between the codes is that if this same building were a half a mile south um, in the UZO, it would be required 42 parking spaces and, you know, so you're saying if if the if the so that Council Lady Benedict is, has stated in our packet that she and Council Lady Van Rees, whose district is directly across the street, are actively trying to extend the UZO to include this property. If they were successful, that's their desire, expressed desire. If they were successful, you would have only be required to have 42 spaces. Right, which is so less that, than half of what's required today. Okay. But, but I guess what, what I don't know is half a mile down the road, what, what does the, the, the backside of that? Trinity Lane. And like? so, you know, you have a very similar pattern along Gallatin Pike, which is two doors in on either side were residences. And over the last 20 years, this body actually has, has changed the zoning two doors in on either side of Gallatin to encourage commercial development. And so you're starting to see MUL and CS zoning up and down Gallatin Pike. And so that's what you see in the zoning code. Now, the businesses that exist down there have started changing rapidly. We've started seeing restaurants grow and build in this space south of Trinity Lane. We've seen an influx of, I'm trying to think of great examples, but there's, the Publix is one that I can think of right off the bat. Publix is going in right now. They're doing that installation. But Publix isn't south of Trinity Lane. It's north of Trinity Lane near Douglas. This is in Inglewood a little bit further Douglas down. is south. Uh, sorry, Douglas is south, yeah. but this is north of that. That's right. Okay, so, and so I'm thinking that Publix is near Douglas. You're in Inglewood, so you're about, what, a mile from Trinity Lane? Yeah, about that. Okay. That's why I, I, I just think that we keep talking about the Publix, but I think the Publix is near Douglas, and this is not that close to Douglas. The patterns are the same. So the residential patterns, if you look at a map, if you expanded that map out, you'd see a very similar residential housing pattern. In fact, identical. And so the density is the same. The components of those neighborhoods are the same. The demographics are the same. Everything is the same about it. The difference is the distance. <clears throat> Can we close the? Is there anything else that you? Any other questions? And I think I think your time was up, so I want to ask if you Long had anything time. to add. But the questions are everybody can ask a question if they want. If not, we'll close the public hearing. Thank you. Um, discussion. I. Sorry, I just cannot see. Recreating the wheel on the parking. And I'm, well, I, I'm with. I, I'm very concerned that we have a residential neighborhood behind it, and I, and I think these gentlemen are operating in in good faith and making oh, yeah. good faith assumptions. But I don't. There's just no guarantee about. You know, I mean, we've all seen offices where 
it, there are, there's 3,000 square feet and there's two people, but, but we don't, none of us know. It could be that, that a, a young incubating <coughs> business tries to put as many people as possible in a small place, and to me that seems likely, and, and y'all are, y'all, the, the applicants are making assumptions in their favor, which is what they're supposed to do. I, I do the same thing. But my concern is that there is a 25% reduction, and I, I want to err on the side of the residents. And I, I would be okay with the reduction if I if I know if I know there's something built in so that if there's a problem for the neighbors, that you have to come back and deal with it, or if you have a an alternate site. But what I think I'm uncomfortable reducing at 25%. And then it's just on the neighbors. I mean, if in, if in a year y'all are wrong about your assumptions or things change and all of a sudden but, we've got people on Sunny Mean and Norvell who are thinking, why do I have every day, you know, four or five cars parked in front of my house? Um, so I guess I've got, to, I've right. got I don't a, know how to deal with it. Well, I've got a, I've got a different thought that maybe it's just to, just to consider. Um, I don't know. I don't know that we have ever really, as a board, uh, granted a parking variance without a study, and they provided a study, and it was a pretty. It was, you know, by a, a company that um, Birch Transportation LLC. I don't know the company, but it's not them. Um, and they have five properties that they studied that uh, were identified as similar properties, and. They're proposing the the spaces on average, and that when I was asking them about that earlier, I said, well, if you take out the high and low, it increases the average. You know, maybe two. Uh, it would require them to have 74 instead of 72, so that's um, not a big difference. And if you only looked at the the property that was <coughs> the same square footage, it it would take them up to 80 from the 72. And so, to me, they're they're based on this study, what they're proposing, they're within 10% uh, of any of the like properties, uh, regardless of type, um, you know, in, in the study. And so it makes me a little, it makes me comfortable with their range, but, and, and again, it's the second uh, council member request that I've, I've missed, but, um, you know, when you, when you get support from you know, uh, Council Lady Benedict and Van Rees um, saying, you know, hey, we're, we're really anticipating this being uh, part of the UZO and, and they would be required to have less space. Um, I mean, as a, as a property owner, I would want a decision because I want to know what to do with my property. Um, but I also know if I held it for six months, I might not even have to be here. And so, you know, I'm, I'm almost thinking, do you give a, um, you know, a, a two-year variance on the 72 spaces and with the condition that after two years, if they meet current zoning requirements, then they don't have to come back. But if they uh, don't meet current zoning requirements, then they would be required to make their case again to say that the, the behavior, uh, that their traffic study was correct. Uh, it, it, to me, that's the stopgap that's there. If the, UZO get, if the UZO passes in the next two years, then their 72 spaces are more than the code would require. Uh, but if, if the UZO doesn't pass, and two years down the road, they really needed 100 spots, or you know, they needed the 98 spaces, and that's still the code, and the neighbors come and say, man, this is really a disaster, then, then their variance expires, and they'll have to secure those 20 something spaces somewhere else. Um, it, it, it gives them that that opportunity. Um, it, it holds them accountable for the, the full space. And, and I don't, I think that their study shows that they have a case that they should have a, a variance. Um, but their study is based on assumptions comparing properties that aren't like this property. That's why I have a problem with the study. The study is pointing to Armory, Hill Oaks, and Grassmere Park. Those properties aren't like this property, and they don't directly abut against a single-family neighborhood. And so, for me, if I, I I understand the parking study, but then I listen to their representations that there might be 30 office units in here, and that each might have one to five employees, and that then they also might have visitors if they're a CPA or an attorney or anything like that. And I don't, 
I have conflicting, I have their testimony of that, and then I have this parking study, and I just, I can't reconcile that. So uh, until the law changes, I don't see a reason to justify the parking reduction. And we haven't even got to the setback reduction on the step back that they want on the height. We haven't talked about that either. But I understand the chairman's rationale. I just, I, you know, I drive down this area. I'm fairly familiar with it. The, like, uh, commission, or Mr. Pepper has pointed out, Norvell and Sunny Meet are fairly narrow. And as someone who does live right off a corridor, my street is pretty narrow, but sometimes something doesn't look like you should park in front of somebody's house. But if there's no parking where you're going, you will park in front of somebody's house and walk to where you're going. And so um, that's sort of why I can't support such a, I'm not saying that a parking variance isn't granted, but as it's been proposed, I can't, can't support it. Would, would, I, I, um, I'm, I'm with you, but, but I like the stopgap measure too that you've had, would, would you, be amenable to a year. Oh yeah. Well, you know, I mean, however long they think it's going to take. I mean, I guess the, the to me the the main issue is, uh, you know, you're you're kind. Of, I think you're. Aren't you bound by the the laws is when you're permitted, right? So I mean, if they get their if they get all their permits now, they're bound by the parking. If, if I guess if <coughs> if they were to get um, get their permit today and the UZO and their zoning change tomorrow, would their parking requirement change to the new requirements, or would it bound like the short-term rentals to be whatever the perm whatever it was that day? They'd be vested in the guidelines that are in place at the time of permit issuance, and obviously since we haven't gotten to that point yet, based in part upon these requests, uh, if there's a change in law, they benefit from that change in law. So uh, if you give the temporary approval, like has been contemplated in the discussion here today, then by the time they come back, if they benefit from a change in law, then they would be carrying that. It might mean that they, if, for example, the UZO is expanded, gives them that reduced parking count that they then meet, they would need to come back. So, or uh, on the other hand, uh, the devil's, I mean, more of the long, uh, the I don't want to, or I'm, I'm not inclined to provide a variance argument if we didn't provide a variance and they could go rent from the church or the other places that they said they had been talking to those 26 spaces and at such time the code didn't require them to have 98 they would not have to rent those spaces anymore so but they could use that as a stopgap measure if in fact they were able to meet it pursuant to the off-site parking agreement standards 17.20.080 um, until such time they didn't need it and they could discontinue that arrangement and meet the zoning code get a UNO that says so okay so the only problem that I see with your basically kick it down the road a little ways, the two years, the one year, whatever, is you're putting the onus on the people in the neighborhood to come back. And they may, they may be working. They may not be able to show up here when we meet again to offset uh, the basically almost what could then be argued as a vested right. No, I, I, I get it, but I, and, and it's only solely based on the fact that the council lady has said we're trying to actively change this. I mean, if it was just simply their testimony, then I might have a little more concern about it, but... She hasn't when, done it yet. So, I mean, well that, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit more... I'm, I'm having a difficult time to get there. That's even before we get to the other part, and we got phase two of this, or part two of this. I'm more of a parking proponent type person than I am anything else. That and sidewalks. You know my hot buttons yeah. today, but I mean it's. No, I get it. It's, it's fair. I don't, but like I said, I, I, um, and and I, I'm okay. I, I guess I, I get I get what you're saying. I think it's really true that neighbors who are working, you know, they can't you don't show have, up. That you don't have time. I, what I think though is that if it becomes a problem over there, I I think they will talk to their council lady, and. That does I mean, that's why I think we have to be very protective today because there may be people that they didn't even have time to figure out what was going on because their lives are too busy. Um, much less know that we're, we're meeting today. Sell it again to us. Maybe the council person can show up. Well, then you can file an initial change in the area. I mean, but I may get outvoted, so it doesn't really matter. No, it's, it's fine. I mean, I, I just, and again, I, I mean, I know Nancy and Emily both very very well and I don't think I, I think both would be uh, considered very pro community and neighborhood folks I mean they um, it's so I, you know I, I, 
I have no doubt that they are considering the, the whole picture and in, in, in their work. Um, and, and maybe that is, if, if we need to get more information from them, uh, then that's fine. And the, the applicant certainly has the, the opportunity to, to find the spaces within a, a appropriate range for a, a, a period of time in which the code requires it. Um, so do we want the, I mean, I'm not sure where this this one's going, but do we want to talk about the, the step back and see where people are uh, there? You know, the request is for, I think just the corner of the building is what, uh, the, the prominent corner of the building is what violates the step back along with the canopy. Uh, I'll get to the point on it for me. I, I have no problem with that. I think it's a real. I think it's a very nice design, and it's a very minimum intrusion. So, my my concern was the parking. I agree, and I think it's. I think that they've taken in design considerations, as the applicant said, and they're going to step back as they go into the neighborhood from the four to the three. So I didn't have. Um, I understood that, and I didn't have an issue with that as well as Mr. Pepper. Then I'll, I'll make a motion that we approve the uh, variance to the build to zone requirements as requested and proposed by the applicant. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Any opposed? That motion passes. Um, so the outstanding issue is the parking. Um, and is there a, a... It's a pretty big issue. Well, it is a big issue. And, you know, I guess to me that, well, there's uh, there's a couple paths. We can, we can you know, grant the variance with... Uh, 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 some requirements on the variance. We can deny the variance outright, uh, or we can uh, ask for additional information that might help uh, those that don't want to grant the variance uh, an opportunity to reconsider. And I don't, like I said, I'm, I'm not trying to push either one. I mean, I, I, I made a case where I thought that it was acceptable for a variance, others disagreed. And so, um, those that disagree, where are you? Do you? If you had additional information from anybody, council lady, more like properties, would it change your mind? And if it wouldn't, then we'll just vote and see where we are. So, I mean, I... I think we should just vote to see where we are because I don't even, I don't see a hardship. Okay. I think it's a self-imposed hardship by the design. Okay. I would be, I'm, I think it's close. I, I, I hear y'all's position. Also, I'm I think with the year, I wouldn't be okay with going two years, but I think that if we allowed it for a year to see how it went, and I would, it sounds like there's a very involved council person or two that, that if there were parking issues, they would know about it. I would be okay with that, but. The one thing about the, the one thing about the year is that it, my, my gut says within a year, that thing is gonna be barely built if, at all uh, I'm not sure it's going to be built and occupied and so all it does and if it is like maybe it's 30 percent 50 percent occupied in a year I don't know uh, if and so to me it, it does allow them to to continue with their plans not raise the issues that you're talking about and uh, take advantage of any legislation that the council people are proposing and you all may not Think that's a good path, but that that is, I, I'm okay with the year just to say, you know, if they're serious about it, if this is going to happen, then then fine. Otherwise, they built you know they build it as is, and in a year from now, they've got to provide 96 spaces. However, they do. Well, let me flip it around on you the other way. Take the other side of that same coin is they'll have a year while they're attempting to build it to get their council persons to go in there and change it, so that then they would not even be coming back here. So, you know, then I'm just flipping it around, and they may put their effort more into the legislative side of this than the administrative side, which is kind of where I think it really should be. I mean, that's what well, the in folks want to have. Uh, in other counsel. words, we may get to the same outcome. And if they come two back, they can two always come routes. back while they're working and revisit us. And they may have something, you know, closer in nature, because I'm... Davis and I sort of, I think, are thinking the same way, scary though that might be. 
Well, I do think, I do think, I, and, well, and, and <laughs> I think I just insulted you in a left-handed way. And I didn't even do anything. I was just sitting here listening. Well, and, and frank, frankly, they, they are, uh, they're, 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 they're two, two angles to get up the same hill. You know, I mean, the goal's the same, uh, you know, and that's to, to, to have, to, to meet codes and have adequate parking. Um, I just know that I've had people plunk themselves in my front yard and every time there's an event that maybe certain folks at universities that have parties and what have you, I know that my blood pressure probably goes up higher than my cardiologist would like it. And if they did it every day, there'd be another vacancy in this. Problem. All right, so just so the formality, did either one of you want to make a motion I'll make a motion to deny the parking variance due to a lack of hardship. And then second. have a motion, have a second, any discussion? All in favor of that motion, say aye and raise your hand. All opposed? That motion uh, fails two to three. Um, and just, and, and this one's not going to pass either, but just that so they're both out there. So before <laughs> Christina comes and, and, and uh, you know, Christina comes and, and if she wants to review the, the, the hearing, uh, she can, but I'll, I'll move that uh, we provide a parking variance uh, for one year, uh, at which case the applicant can uh, return to the BCA uh, for an additional request or if they are uh, meeting current code at the time of the expiration of this variance, then they would need to come back. And that, that parking variance would be to... For 72, 72 yes, the, 20, the, the reduction that they requested, 25% to 72 spaces. So there's a motion, there's a second. Any discussion? All in favor of that motion, raise your hand. All opposed? And that motion uh, fails uh, three votes to two. And so that'll remain, uh, both motions will remain on the docket uh, for 30 days. Uh, if neither receives four votes within that 30 days, then the variance request is denied by rule. Great. Thank you. Thank Good you. luck. Thank you. Next case. Next is case 2020-040. This is involving property at 823 and 825 21st Avenue North. It's a request for variances from the rear setback requirements to construct two single family residences. Before you now is the zoning of the property showing you the zoning is RM20. The aerial photography giving you a sense of the surrounding area. Site plan submitted by the applicant, and finally, the current <coughs> conditions of the property. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 40? Yes. There is. So each side will have 10 minutes to make your desired presentation. Please be sure to identify yourself by name and address. We've got the same thing. Good afternoon. Mm -hmm. My name is Aziz Asharov, and I'm the applicant and the owner of these two properties. Um, that are located at the 823 and 825 21st Avenue North. And what we're asking for is a um, variance on the rear setback. These properties used to be um, longer piece of properties before they started uh, building that railroad and they uh, did it right away and it got a lot smaller and now um, the, the building envelope is so small that it wouldn't let us build the normal size of a house. And um, the illustration on the, uh, on the survey that we have on the site plan shows... Uh, so you said site, okay. Do, do we have the site plan in our package? Okay. Oh, I actually have... have. Uh, Printed some copies. I don't think you guys have it. And are, are you one, are you building four houses or two houses? No, house, two houses. Two houses on one lot or two houses on two lots. Two, on two lots. It used to have each of those lots used to have a house. So what we're doing is basically demolishing one, putting one back. And yeah, the the wording of it on this it says that it would allow us to build two houses, but it's actually one house on each lot. Okay. It's the same way it's, as it used to be. And the, the current house is one on the uh, 825 was demolished in 2007. 
and the one on the A23, we just demolished it. And it used to be um, sitting on the property, uh, about five to seven feet from the property line, from the rear, the new property line after the um, right away. And we demolished it. And we're not even asking to put it in the same footprint. We're asking it to put it back uh, about 10 feet from the property line. Have you talked, your, we got a letter from your council member saying there'd been opposition and he wasn't supporting of this. Have you talked to your council member? Uh, we, we did email, but the, we, you know, uh, we don't have, we have a problem of him emailing back. Okay. So you haven't, you haven't been able to talk no, with him? Oh, actually, yeah, we, we tried, but it didn't really, you know. Yeah, I mean, I'd, it'd be nice to know a little bit more about his opposition because when I when I first read your you know you didn't really have a uh, you didn't have your site plan uh, in the packet and so when I read your application it, it looked like you were trying to build two houses on each lot that, that, that's what I think is the opposition could be because uh, reading on this um, small explanation it looks like if it was granted it would allow me to build two single family residence it already allows me because i'm a, in a two separate lot and it's existing lots and it used to have a houses on each one and the metro codes allows us when uh, you have an existing house and you demolish you can put it back another house in there that is that is correct but you still have to meet the bulk regs so yeah. He can build them by right if he meets the bulk regs. If he can't meet the bulk regs, he cannot build them unless you grant the variance. Right, and he's not asking for a. You're not. He's not asking for a lot size variance. Or, so I mean, it's. So the lots are buildable lots. You just want to build it. Well, I, I guess I understand. I understand that. I just like I said, it'd, it'd be nice if things were. It, it, if we'd have gotten more clear information on the front end, and your council person had actually seen what you know, seen this and if that had impacted uh when i was uh filing this uh i talked to the zoning examiner and he draw it out on the parcel view and he said that would be sufficient that's why we didn't have this ready and uh, i got this request the day uh, i think it was yesterday or the day before yesterday about this uh, site plan that we needed this type of a site plan so we got it in uh yesterday but until then, we thought these were sufficient, the ones right. which was turned in. Yeah. And I, I understand that. It just, like I said, it, it may have, you know, we can only assume that that may be what the confusion is, but it'd be nice to know more definitively what the council person's issues were because, it, you know, like I said, on the, I, I, I understand your lots were, the railroad impacted the lots. I understand that. Um, but I really would like to understand more specifically what the opposition is. But. So you say in your application that if you have to build within the required setbacks, it would be almost impossible to build uh, something. <coughs> or, or do you? Is it impossible? I mean, what? what well, would, have you done a look at what would your square footage be of if you had to comply with these setbacks? Uh, considering the front contextual. Um, setbacks being the minimum required, which is 20 feet, and then uh, considering that the side setbacks being, since it's a small lot, being three feet on each side, and uh, that would leave the building envelope to be on uh, the small one, 33 minus the two sides having a three and three, that would be 27, and then uh, 64 deep, so if we deduct the 20 and 20, that would be 24, 24 by 27 uh, building envelope to build on, on those lots. So that would be what about. What would that translate to in square footage? Uh, in square feet wise, it would be about 500 something. 20, yeah, 27 times. 24 by 40. 27, oh, 648. <coughs> that is the buildable area in that lot. <coughs> Do we have any maps to show what's close by? <clears throat> is, is, 
Okay. Is that the railroad behind? Is that what we're seeing right there, the tracks? Yeah, behind. The railroad's right in the backyard. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Do you know how, how far how far is your property line from the actual railroad track? Uh, it, it's the building that it was there is about 100 feet, but the building is not there anymore. But the the um, from the back of the building to the actual railroad is about 100. Feet. And it looks like uh, on the the drawing that you thought you were okay to submit that we needed more information from. It looks like that that building that was there, okay, so it, it sat maybe, did it, how far back was it sitting? It, it was sitting less than 10 feet. Okay. Yeah, and it looks at, it looks at on the drawing, but it just. Yeah, it, it was sitting less than 10 feet and we already demolished it, but we asking to have 10 feet. And was it 20 feet from the front? Yes, yes. So you're keeping the same front setback. You're just asking for a re so. Yes. You're not asking uh, to disrupt the rhythm of the front. No, no. The front we just actual. The what? Rear setback. He's not asking for a front setback. Well, if you're building a new house, it should trigger the sidewalk. Wow. Yeah, but he's not asking for a front setback, so we're presuming that there's space for a sidewalk. I mean, we're just not that he's only asking for a rear setback. I mean, that's not. So we're gonna come back again when they hit him with that one. Well, he's gonna go to the zoning administrator, and if only if he disagrees with him, he will he come to us. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't have to worry about the sidewalk because I have just to, I'm just I have full of... confidence that if that <coughs> goes there, they will agree uh, with planning. Um, Sorry, John. Yeah, no, it's only rear step back that we're talking about now, and it's, you know, they went. Was, was there was, was there there was no opposition to this case, was there? Oh, there is opposition. Okay, I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, I don't. I'm I'm lost. Why would he want to go closer to that railroad? He um, he doesn't. He wants to go closer to his property because he he's saying. The current, the current home is um, less than 10 feet from the back property line. He's gonna pull it away from the road, to, I mean, closer to the street and away from the railroad up to 10 feet. Code requires him 20, but like I said, there was an existing home that is only eight, and it's because the railroad cut it. But he also, if you look at the property line, uh, that there's, there's a substantial distance between the property line and the railroad track. Yeah. He's so going, he's going moving closer to the rail. He wants to move closer to the rear of the property. He wants to move closer to the railroad right. than the code allows, but further from the railroad than the current home. Okay. Is what he is that correct? Yes. Because you, yes. you said exactly the current. Correct. You said the home you just tore down was eight feet from the it's property about line. Five to eight feet, and we want to actually go further towards to 10, the street. Yeah, but you away don't want from a railroad. But you don't want to have to do the twenty that code requires because of the short lot. That, okay. Thank you. That All right. So, it. does anybody have any questions for the applicant now? And then, if not, we'll hear from the opposition. And then. All right. So, let's hear from the opposition and then uh, we'll bring you back. You'll have seven minutes to rebut the opposition. My name is Miss Nichols. I live on 817 21st Avenue North. And the first. I assumed that I thought he gonna be another Skyliner like was next to me where I'm at now. Apparently, he gonna be another house, which is all right. So I don't have no objection if he gonna build another house. So if he, he has two lots um, and he wants to build a, one, a house on each of the lots and he there'll, there'll be at least 20 feet from his front property line, he just wants to build them closer to the railroad in the back. And so are you saying that that's okay if he so does that's that? okay to build a house, but it's just the idea they built a skyline next to my house, and I thought that's what he was going to do. So when you do, say skyline, you're talking about the tall, the tall skinny yes, houses? Yes, next okay. door to me. When I came up to, what, I think, when, uh, I think well, last year, two years ago, when I was up here, and I objected to it, and y'all uh, approved it to have it built. Okay. That's what I, you know, 
That's what I did not like. Okay, but you're okay with what he's proposing right now? That's all right. You don't. He built a house, not no skyline. Okay. <laughs> That's the only thing I object to. All right. So right well, now we got that skyline next to me, and and my antenna gonna get no reception at all in my kitchen part because it's so close. And when they took two feet of my land, that's another, another objection. All right. right. Well, then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you for being here. All right. We'll hear from the applicant again. Okay. So. Um, so are you building tall scoonies? Well, the, the more the lot is less, we would have to go more up. Giving us the, um, the variance, it would actually allow us to be less stories. So is it, it is a two-story home? Yeah, it would allow us to build two-story, but if, if as it is, it is there to be able to um, market it, we can't just sell 1,200 square feet. So we would have to go three-story and then maybe even, you know. But you're all... If it is, if it is you know, if we don't get... If we don't what, get what, the variance, yeah. and what what you're saying is, if you get this variance, then it'll be it'll be limited to two, and you would be you would not object to us limiting it to two stories uh, as a condition of the variance. It would have um, on the second top of the second floor. It would have the you know the porch and stuff. Yeah, ma'am. Hang on, ma'am. All right, so. Are you, and are you saying you're you you're gonna have you're gonna have to go taller if you don't get this? Yeah, if, <coughs> this, if the building envelope is smaller, we would have to go taller. So if the building envelope is wider, we don't have specific plans yet. Is that, is that a yet. guarantee? I mean, are you or can you can you assure us that if? Well, you can put a very you could put the a halfway. Yeah, but you I, could I, a, there's a, already a um, the uh, the height limit on this property, which is 30 feet. So the, the, the furthest part of it would be 30 feet, unlike any other other properties that would be 45 feet on the regular uh, lots and stuff. This is right here is a 30 feet height limit on it. Uh, he can so confirm it. If, if you were granted the variance, what could you limit the height to? Uh, we, we could work with that 30. We're not asking for more. It's usual, the tall skinnies, they can go up to 45 feet, which is you know, 15 extra feet, then these lots are allowed since they are really small. Oh, and I guess what... Well, you're so sure you're not... Or, yeah, I mean, you're, you're not... We want a commitment from you're, you're, is what we're trying to get. What you're saying is you're, you, you're going to go up to 30 feet either way, whether you... However you build it, you're going to push it to 30 feet. And I don't know what the tall skinny... I mean, I'm assuming the tall skinny is 45 or... I don't think 45 is the height. I don't know, but I think that was from earlier, and that was in a special district. This is in a residential area. But also, like, one of the things that Ms. Lamb said at the beginning was that he can only build two if he can meet the bulk regs. We don't even know if he can meet the bulk regs with building two because these lots are so small. So I think we're, like, we're negotiating against ourselves and, like, uh, like, we're negotiating its two evils that we don't even know exist because we don't even know if he can build two back on this because they're so small. Yeah. Well, uh, other than we may assume he can meet him if he's not asking for a variance, right? Right. Well, I mean, I, we know I, we know he can't. We know he doesn't want to meet the setback because he's asking for that. But I would, and maybe I'm wrong. I would just think he would be asking for it. But I, I, I agree. With the, I mean, to me, what I'm hearing from you and what I'm hearing from you and, and what I'm feeling for myself is, especially given the description of what he just said was that and, and the council members objection is that f from and the neighbors uh, assumptions she came down here. Yeah, I mean she came down here. That's, well, that's is it that we really need more information <laughs> and, and either some type of uh, elevation or something that just says what what are you actually trying to build here? Um, I mean, this yes. is a wish list and, and we are we're bidding against ourselves and and I think if, if the council well. member been in more support than I was the one bidding against ourselves. <laughs> 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 so, it wasn't you and it wasn't you. It was definitely me. So, 
No, that was so that. I, I think Frank, that my I don't, scrunch forehead Frank is a different. dead giveaway that I just got lost somewhere. Oh, right, because, well, because we just had gotten this, you know, today, and 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 certainly. Uh, I mean, I, I can see, and I can't speak for every, anybody else, that you certainly have a narrow lot. I see that there is a potential case for uh, us considering a, a rear setback, but I also, based on, again, the, the council member not, uh, and again, I can't speak to why you all have had a communication uh, issue, but the, the letter from the council member and the description of what you're gonna do being a little counter to what the neighbor thought, you know, she thought it was a house, and it is a house, but it's a type of house that, that may impact uh, I, it feels like that there should be additional information, either either con uh, conversations with the council member, bringing him on board, uh, and or some elevations that the neighbor can agree to and say, oh yeah, I understand what you're doing and that makes sense, so that nobody's surprised when it's built. And what that usually means is that we defer this case, uh, either one meeting or two meetings, uh, however long you think it'll take to make that happen, and then we'll go from there. So. Uh, do you think you can accomplish that in two weeks, which is one meeting, or would you like to have the first this come back to us the first meeting of uh, March? Uh, considering the experience that I had trying to reach out to the council members, I think more than two weeks probably because okay. I, last time we tried to reach out, it's been you know more than two weeks and haven't got okay reply. So I, I don't think two weeks will be sufficient. But if uh, if we get you know in touch sooner. You know, we don't have a problem. Or if you guys can direct okay. us. Well, you know what? I'll, I'm gonna I'm, I'll move that we defer this one meeting until the 20th of February. And if you need more time, then you uh, contact uh, Emily and just say, uh, can we defer that again? And that, that's certainly fine. But I'll I'll give you the the opportunity to come back in two weeks if you're ready. If you're not ready, then just let her know, and we'll just push it out uh, another meeting until then. Uh, but that'll that'll. Uh, <coughs> Yeah, that'll be to your to your advantage. So it, with, with that, that's a motion. It's a second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? So that that uh, is deferred until next meeting. Uh, uh, again, with the assumption you'll talk to your council member and uh, get us some additional information. So that again, and talk to your neighbor too. So, thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, we're gonna take a three minute quickie break, and then we'll hear our two short term rentals, and then be done. Uh, last two cases um, for the short terminal docket. The next one is 2020-029 involving property at 208 Northside Drive. This is a d appeal of a denial of a permit due to operation after the permit expired. Bob Osborne will make the presentation on behalf of staff. I would point out that this permit was issued in 2016. As the board knows, state law dictates that the law in effect at the time the permit was issued is the law that governs the property um, with respect to short-term rentals. And at this time in 2016, when the permit was issued, there was no discretion in terms of the one-year wait. So that's something to bear in mind as you hear this case. All right, we're gonna, we'll hear from uh, Mr. Osborne and then we'll hear from the appellant. So the uh, permit was issued back in June of 2016. Um, and it was renewed each year until Is there anybody in opposition? Sorry. Um, so it was issued in 2006, June of 2016. It was renewed in 2017 and 18, but it was not re renewed in 2019. Uh, it looks like we received the do renewal documents on November 18, 2019, which is well past the expiration. Um, no complaints, um, no notices sent. It looks like the advertisement was removed around December 23rd. Okay, any questions? All right, if you would uh, state your name and address and tell us um, why you're here. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I'm Glenn, I go by Dale. Okay. Glenn Smith and this is my wife, Patricia. Uh, we live at 208 Northside Drive. We've been there for 34 years. Um, and after mistaking, mistakenly thinking our permit was up to date, um, I emailed Mr. Osborne uh, for verification and to get a current copy of the permit. Um, as he had stated, we've been, we had uh, current permits for 2016, 17, 18. And when Mr. Osborne answered, uh, saying he had no record of receiving a payment, 
I went back in my records and discovered that he was, he was correct. Our, our permit had expired and I had failed to renew. Immediately that day, November 15th, I sent a renewal check for $313 with the applicable affidavits. Um, I waited until December 5th, uh, not hearing anything from Mr. Osborne or seeing that the check had, had not cleared. I contacted him by email to see if the check had been received. Uh, my email was re uh, answered with an out of office reply stating that he would be out until the first of the oh. year. And he had directed me to Mr. McBroom uh, and I had sent the same information to he copying uh, David Frabet. Uh, Mr. Frabet responded on December 10th. Um, Mr. Frabet stated by email that our permit had expired June 3rd, 2019, and that all STRP activity should cease. And I responded to him uh, apologetically, saying it was an oversight on my part, and I, I went straight to the codes office that day and was told that when I arrived and stated my purpose that I should come back the next day to see Mr. Frabit. Uh, my, my wife and I were at the codes office when the doors opened and waited to see Mr. Frabit. He was straightforward and thorough in explaining the steps needed to appeal our case for possible reinstatement. Upon leaving his office that afternoon, we immediately contacted Airbnb and shut down our rental. Mr. Frabit referred us to Jessica Shepard, who sent us detailed instructions outlining the steps that we were to take in the Board of Zoning Appeals process. Um, we feel we've uh, followed all the steps required to be able to come before you today. Um, we have the sign in our yard, the letters to the neighbors, and uh, Council Member um, Young, Zach Young. We recognize our failure to obtain our renewal permit in a timely manner. Please know it was an honest oversight. We've been faithful and unassuming Airbnb hosts for over three years. We are retired and live on site. We've lived in our house for 34 years. We've conducted our business with little fanfare or disruption to our quiet neighborhood. We're currently, uh, we are current with all of our hotel occupancy taxes, and we uh, respectfully ask to have the opportunity to have our permit reinstated. Okay. Um, any questions at this point? The um, the the hardest thing about my job on these short-term rental cases is, is in cases like these, um, the the evidence, and, and again, we haven't uh, voted on it, but the zoning administrator determined that you'd operated after the permit had expired, and that was substantiated by your testimony. So I'm assuming that uh, the finding of this board will be that you did operate after the permit expired. And what um, you heard at the beginning of this case was that uh, your original permit was issued at a time when state law, uh, well, actually at a time when the um, penalty for operating on an expired permit was a year. And the state law has, is the law that um, grandfathers permits to um, be under the rules that were in place when they got the permit. In most cases, that is beneficial to the property owner. In cases like this, it's not. And so if we find as a board that you operated um, on an expired permit, the law in place, which we have no control over, which is the sad part of this job to say, because in most expired per cases, um, it's been rare that we've required anybody to wait uh, substantially long uh, to get a permit. Uh, in this case, I, we don't have that leeway. And so I take the time to say that because I personally won't, and I have no reason to doubt my fellow commissioners won't, what's in your best interest here. Um, and the, I think the fastest way for you to get a permit is not to have us rule uh, that you 
operated on an expired permit. Um, if we operate, if we do that, it's based on our finding, which is today, February, whatever today is, sixth. Six, thank you. Uh, so you have to wait until next year, February sixth. If you withdraw the case or we defer it indefinitely, then I think you're eligible to apply. And I'm, I'm looking to codes to. It may even be June third when their permit expired, but. It was during the month of November. We don't have the exact date. So when you all, so it'd be sometime in November when um, you would be able to, to apply. It would save you three or four months, and that is absolutely the best that this board can do. So, um, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm happy with, you know, uh, deferring it indefinitely so that you all can go back and look at it and talk to codes and see if that's the right thing. And if you need us to come back and make a decision, we can. But just we've heard enough of these to know that if it were me and I wanted to get my permit the fastest I possibly could, us voting today is not the way to do it. Um, and so, but like I said, um, it's probably not the news you wanted to hear. It's not the news I wanted to give. But it also, uh, if you want to, uh, we can defer it indefinitely, which means that it's still on the plate. So if you want to go back and think about it, talk to the code staff again, just to make sure, yeah, this is this is truly our fastest path to get back on board. I'm happy to defer it. Um, if you want to just go out and withdraw, you know, or you can withdraw it, or we can vote today. But if we vote today, February 6, 2021 is the soonest that you'll be able to apply for a permit. And uh, a path for sooner than that is to have us not vote. So what would that entail for us as far as waiting until November? Just this process all over again? No, you wouldn't. You wouldn't go through this process at all. You'd uh, just come back <coughs> and apply for the permit yeah. in in November, just like we did when right. we just like we did when we started. Just like you did like when you originally got your thing passed. So <coughs> we would not be bound. We wouldn't be limited by the operation on the expired permit at that point. Yeah, and so like I said, I. I <coughs> Um, I, I hate it because it, uh, I, I, you know, we all do our best to follow the rules, but we also hope that the rules uh, marry with fairness. And this is a case where, in my opinion, it doesn't feel uh, fair, but it's, it's the, the law and, the, and we're bound by that. And so that's why I don't like having to share it. But that said, I would like to give you the opportunity to have a lower penalty and us voting will not allow that. So um, is it acceptable for us to just defer this indefinitely? That way, if, if you want to bring it back, you can, but if you don't want to bring it back, you can just get your permit. And that way, you know, you don't have to go through the act of withdrawing, which is something you like, well, I might want to talk to somebody else about it. All right. And that eligible date would be when? Uh, you'd have to talk. Uh, can we do it? I think uh, November 30th was our last then it would be November 30th. We, we, we don't have the information in front of us, but it would be whatever the last, the date of your last rental. So November 30th. Okay. So um, I, I'll close the public hearing and move that we uh, defer this case indefinitely. And uh, it, compliment. I mean, it, it's kind of refreshing to see someone fall on the sword and admit it like they did. Right. From, from a standpoint, I mean, it kind of refreshing actually. Well, and the, and the thing that, that feels so unfair is it, it that, other than forgetting to send in your 50, you know, your not, it used to be $50, but now your $300 renewal fee, other than forgetting to do that, all indications are that they operated exactly like the ordinance asked them to. And that, that's why it feels in this case to not be not any it. leniency possible. Well, that's what it is. We just, we're not, we're bound by state law to, 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 to follow the code that was in place when you had it. We have no leniency, and that's we, we've. I, I tell you, you're not the first one that we've had to say this, uh, and may not even be the last today. But it, um, but we've asked, you know, is there a path? Is there a path? And and and, it, and explored it because it just does not feel fair for folks that have followed the rules. And there's just not a there's just not a way to do that. I mean, I, I wish that there wasn't. It wasn't that way. May, may I ask a question, please? Um, obviously, we are adults. <laughs> and should have known the date to go in and, and renew our permit. We acknowledge that. But is there a reminder sent, an email to remind you of that? I, 
if yes, we, codes, we, mails out renewal notices for every permit. There are currently 5,900 permits in the city. We send out renewal permit renewal letters for all 5,900. What the Postal Service does with those, you know, some of them may get lost. Some of them, you know, it, you don't receive them or you, it gets thrown out because you think it's junk mail. We don't know, but we do send those out every year. Thank we, you. Yeah. We, 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 we to don't get recall one. get. I mean, yeah. we don't. We did not get one, but that doesn't mean that one of We're those didn't happen. Yeah. yeah. So thank you. All right. So um, again, uh, closed public hearing. Move that we defer it indefinitely. Second. There's a second. All in favor, say aye. That motion passes. Again, sorry you're in that situation. We're not the legislative body, but uh, we did the best we could do for you, and we wish you best of luck. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you for seeing us. All right, last case. <clears throat> the last case is case 2020-029, involving property at 979, I'm sorry, 033. Well, apparently I don't have a slide for that, so my apologies. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> rough, rough week. Right. <laughs> 2020 involving property at 979 Windrow Drive. This is a challenge to the determination um, of not issuing a permit due to operating without a permit. On this particular case, I would note that because there was no permit ever issued, they fall under the current law. The current law mandates a one-year waiting period from the time the zoning administrator determines that a that there was operation without a permit. Um, and specifically says that the board does not have the discretion to vary that time. Okay. And, and Emily, we, the, the fellow behind you was standing. here in opposition. Oh, for so this case. So we will have 10 minutes after Mr. Osborne okay. makes our presentation. All right. It, Mr. Osborne. Yeah, so it looks like this property operated from November to December of 2019, five rentals. Um, we became aware of it on December 3rd, and my coworker uh, sent an abate notice for it. Looks like the uh, advertisement was removed around December 11th of 2019. <coughs> we don't have any complaints on file. Okay. All right, if you would state your name and address and tell us why you're here. Good afternoon. Thank you for, uh, for your patience today and we appreciate you listening to us. Um, if you'd like to be refreshed, we're going to fall on our sword as well. When we discovered that um, I'm sorry, my name is uh, Jim Shadburn. This is my wife, Julie. We, were, we live at 979 Windrow, the property in question. So um, we wanted to rent out a single room in our house um, as an Airbnb, and we thought, um, we mistakenly didn't think we needed a permit. We discovered very quick, or we discovered through a notice that we received um, that we were wrong about that. Um, the statement is, is dated 12-3, just like they said. Um, we did operate. Um, we, were, we don't dispute that. Um, and we're very sorry about that. And we're very, uh, when we got the, um, the notice, we immediately followed what the notice said to do, which was to go to codes. We did the several things that were supposed to be done in order to <coughs> obtain a permit. When we finally were able to get an appointment with codes was the 13th, which I was told that that day was the day that a new law was enacted. I think that's the law that she is referred to that mandates uh, a year wait for a permit. What we're asking is that uh, because we were, noti we were notified before that that we would be subject to the prior law. And we're just asking for any kind of leniency that we can get from the board if that law allows leniency to uh, reduce the time that we have to wait to apply for a permit. Okay. Actually, I will add a, a, for a side note. We did try to get in earlier in the office. We had an appointment and the office was shut down due to the flu. And so we would have be actually been there before the 13th. We were really trying to be compliant. We took out our business license, and we thought because when we lived in the home that you didn't have to do all the other permitting. Right. And so once we were notified, we're like, oh, okay. And we did take the site down. We put the the yard notices. We sent out the all the letters, the billions of letters. And, right. and is there uh, for codes? Is there uh, they raised an issue of when they came in versus when the law changed, and is that? 
So I can't speak to any appointment they had. Uh, we don't typically take appointments, so I'm not aware right. of what appointment they might be referencing. Um, the law, the current law says, or in a, state law says the law in effect at the time the permit was issued would be the law that governs that there the use no of that property. No permit was issued. Right. Therefore, the law that you know applies when they come in to apply for the permit, that's the law that applies. When they came in and sat down with our zoning examiner to apply for the permit, it was under the current law. And the current law? The current law says that... Okay, when did it, it go into effect? Sometime in December. Okay. Uh, I'm not, still December so 13th. I'm not sure the exact... Apparently the 13th of December, but and that's the law that says that really these cases, if you operate without a permit, it's from the date of the zoning administrator's determination and there's no discretion for the BZA to vary that. And, and that determination was... That would have been on the day we sent the abate notice, which was, or would it be the day they applied? I think it would probably be the, I think it probably would be the day we sent the abate notice, because that's when we made the determination that they were operating without a permit, and that was December 3rd. Well, may, if, if I may, um, I was told by the, the gentleman that I talked to at Codes that, um, yes, you've come in today, and today the law has changed. Um, I pointed out that we had received the notice. The notice was prior to this. Would it not be subject to that law? So he said, I need to talk to my boss about it. The only reason, I mean, it, it, we wouldn't have gone probably, I guess, through all everything if if we had known that that was, that was indeed the case. We were told that um, we could appeal on the grounds that uh, uh, we were um, notified under the old law. But now I, I, I totally understand what you're saying, but that's not what I was told. So, if I guess it, um, I guess the, the only thing I'm thinking is that if if there's any ambi I mean, if there's any merit to going back and looking at to to see, then you know we can defer this and have him go back and talk to the codes folks. But otherwise, he's admitted to renting and. It, it, if 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 it's determined and if there's a potential path to say, hey, I got my letter on December third, I was in violation. Then the you right. Know. I mean, he's what we're happy to re look at it, relook at it within the codes department. Um, I don't know when the law, the current law, would have been considered pending legislation, um, which would affect the permit issuance even prior to the. Right. An effective date, so that you know, I don't think that actually helps them. But you know, we are happy to look at it and review it, and if we can come up with a different determination and handle it administratively. Yeah, it won't that's make what I'm saying. It's not, it's not going to make it, it correct. It it there, it might be a one or two percent chance it's better. Right. I just wanted to give it for the sake of managing expectations. Let them know that there are some roadblocks we got to get past. But we're happy it, to look at I that. Mean, and it, it wouldn't it, hurt them to defer it. To it sounds like can. it's extraordinarily small, but it's it is a, a possibility that you would be under the. I mean, and and if if we vote today again, it's it's going to be a year uh, from the December third. If you all determine uh, that it happened, then it's still a year from December third, even if we don't vote. And so either it sounds like it'd be worth our while and their while just to say, well, let's, let's defer it, let you all look at it, and, and, and as long as you know, whatever they come up with is, is it. No, we're just, yeah, any, I, yes. And we're happy to do that. I would point out that there is some opposition here who would like to address the board. It may be prudent to hear from them. Okay. So if it does come back before the board, y'all will have heard of them from them, and they don't need to come back. Okay. And I, will, right. I will say it is, it is a hotel, so it's one room. It doesn't have a kitchen. We live in the house, right. so it's not... This isn't our total income, so, but okay. just we put a lot of work into doing it. And it's like, no, oh. totally, totally understand. All right, well, let's hear from the opposition, and then uh, we'll have a chance to come back, and then we'll, we'll move from there. Thank you. Sure. All right, if you would state your name and address and tell us uh, your thoughts on this case. I'm James Caldwell. I lived on uh, Mendro, Mendro Drive. I've been there 57 years. I've been there ever since the subdivision was built. And the last year or so, 
there's been so many cars at that address down there that it's almost got me off the road a time or two. And there's four and five cars down there, and, and at least three of them parked on the street out in the pavement. And, and it's every day. And if I go in at night, I've got to really watch to keep them hitting one of them. That's, and that's the reason I'm trying to get this stopped. Okay. I guess that's all I need. Okay, and we can hear from them, and we um, we appreciate you being here, and 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 we uh, our job here is to determine you know if they can you know wh when they can reapply, and and the law allows them at some point in time to reapply, and th that's what we're here, and um, and if we do as I mentioned a minute ago to defer it, then we're going to let the code staff you know make a more accurate determination of when that would be. But but we do appreciate you uh, talking about the traffic and we'll ask them about that when they come back. That's the main reason of all those cars that it's gonna be a wreck there. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you for coming out. All right, we'll hear back from the applicant. Um, so, I'm really I'm not sure um, if he has the right address or what. We have we have a driveway. We share a driveway with our neighbor. Um, they park back there. We park back there. We have uh, designated parking for the Airbnb um, back there. So, uh, we seldom, if ever, park up on the street or have people park up on the street. I'm, I'm not sure. And I know that Mr. Caldwell lives down at the corner of um, Brownlee and um, yeah, Brownlee and, and Windrow. He's quite a bit down, but I'm not sure if, if he's got the right address for us or what, but we don't hardly ever have anybody park. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so, so I guess given what we talked about before and um, are you are you uh, comfortable with us deferring this for you to to work with codes to see? I mean, if we can if we vote today, it's going to be a year from December third. If you talk to codes, it may still be December third uh, next year because that's what the law requires. But they may, uh, based on the time frame that you described, uh, it's conceivable that there might be a, a different a, a path. And and I think we're willing to at least let you go down that road to see if there's a, a, a different alternative. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, again, that, that you might want to observe that his wife was nodding her head up and yeah, down. Yeah, exactly. Right. And he didn't Thank have God, have God for that. Let me just say. Right. All right. <laughs> so. Good. All right. So, uh, if, if there's nothing else to add, I'll, I'll close the public hearing and move that, uh, again, that this case be deferred indefinitely, defer. um, to give the applicant a chance to talk to the code staff. Is, I, I might uh, suggest a specific meeting because if we determine that the law would allow you to vary it, right. then if it's deferred indefinitely, he would have to re-notice it. Okay, well then let's if, just say if it's we determine that y'all can't, then he can just withdraw it. I'll move it to uh, the next meeting, and if you're not able to determine it by then, then we'll go to the next one. So it'll be uh, deferred until uh, the 20th of February, uh, and if. Uh, it's determined that you are eligible for a lower penalty, then we'll hear it that day. If uh, it's determined that you're not, then we won't see you again. <laughs> not that we wouldn't mind seeing you. Um, so that's the motion. There's a second. Any all in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Thank you. All right, good luck. Thank you all. Have a good weekend. Yeah, it keeps making its way. Well, there's an extra one. Oh. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.